Good morning. Good morning, dear colleagues. I'd like to ask you to take your seats and we'll start our session in a minute. Once again, thank you for a very fruitful day yesterday, a lot of discussions. We, have, we had guests here as speakers, the Chairman in Office and Secretary General, and some reports. And we started a debate with, uh, I think, already 12 or up to 15 speakers who spoke yesterday. And we have also a long list of speakers for today. But also, I'd like to remind you that election process is going on now, and it uh, will be until 11 o'clock, so you can vote or come back. So I think this process is now going on. That's why our colleagues are not everybody at this moment in the room, but I think they are, they are coming and arriving. Let's... Uh, Look at our agendas, uh, an agenda for this morning. Draft uh, version of it, it was distributed already, so it's any objections. If there are any objections, we're ready to consider. No objections. Agenda for this session is approved. So, as I told you, we have a long list of 35 speakers for this session. Some of our speakers, they asked to speak today instead of uh, yesterday. So, and one, one additional request, please. We could be short on time and uh, uh, maximum it could be up to two, three minutes. Uh, Two, two is preferable, so uh, please consider it. Well, our first speaker today, this session, Ms. Muradova from Azerbaijan. Спасибо, уважаемый председатель. Наша ассамблея, как площадка для сотрудничества и диалога, дает огромные возможности изучить эффективные пути решения проблем, связанных с безопасностью в нашем регионе. К этим проблемам можно отнести массу вопросов, которые все эти дни Люксембурга стали темой нашего предметного обсуждения. Не буду перечислять, остановлюсь лишь на том, что волнует всех нас, независимо от того, какой национальности, вероисповедания или какому к политическому убеждению относится человек. Это родной дом, где мы родились. Это маленькая улочка, где прошло наше детство. Школа, друзья, город, в который, куда бы мы ни ездили, хотим вернуться, могилы родных людей, которым хотим время от времени поклониться. Мы говорили о мигрантах, которые, не имея официального статуса проживания, теряют своих родных и близких. Говорили о беженцах, внутренне перемещенных лицах. Говорили о детях, как о будущем человечества. Как мы не старались, чтобы миграция людей была результатом их добровольного выбора, и причина их перемещения не была бы шансом спасения от войн и крайней бедности, добиться этого нам не удалось. В документах нашей сессии было отмечено, что военная агрессия приводит к появлению городов-призраков. В моей стране и ее э, семи оккупированных вокруг Нагорного Карабаха районах десятки таких городов и сел, в которых ходят духи моих соотечественных и родных мне людей. Это очень печально. У многих даже нет могилы. А могилы тех, которых успели похоронить, не могут посетить их родные и близкие по разным причинам о которых мы с вами знаем. Ставшие причиной всему этому войны и конфликты разрушают города и привычный уклад жизни затрагивают еще больше людей и превращают их в беженцев и перемещенных лиц иммигрантов. Там мы радуемся тому, что обменялись двумя пленными. 
Но для того, чтобы проблема сдвинулась с мертвой точки, мы должны способствовать обмену всех на всех, которые предлагает Азербайджан. Каждая встреча по переговорному процессу, по мирному разрешению проблема для нас с точки зрения продвижения процесса особо важна. Но любая из них должна быть еще и нацелена на конкретный результат и носить субстантивный характер. Ведь встреча без конкретных результатов, которые выглядят как переговоры ради переговоров, сводит на нет надежду на прекращение все еще приносящего жертвы и бедствия конфликта дипломатическим путем. Таким образом, нам следует вызволить и переговорный процесс из плена, меняющийся на линии соприкосновения огна ситуации, тем самым дав толчок к субстантивному процессу по разрешению. Словом, армия должна вернуться в казармы, а беженцы, перемещенные лица в их родные города и к своей собственности, так как мы отразили в наших документах. Я благодарна всем коллегам за добросовестную работу, проделанную над принимаемой сегодня важной декларацией. Я желаю, чтобы мы также удачно смогли добиться и исполнения отраженных мне рекомендаций, столь важных для спасения человеческой жизни. Спасибо за внимание. Well, thank you, Ms. Muradova. From Canada. Good morning, honorable delegates and fellow parliamentarians. We gather in this parliamentary assembly to facilitate dialogue that advances comprehensive security. There is indeed a fundamental link between security and sustainability. Sustainability deve uh, development, sustainable development represents a path that will help us respond to and mitigate climate change, to reinforce trust in institutions and to build inclusive and stable, and, uh, uh, stable societies. The consequences of the alternatives are real and they are ever more visible in 2019. My country, like all of yours, is already experiencing the effects of climate change. According to Natural Resources Canada, temperatures in Canada are rising at twice the global average and in Canada's Arctic, temperatures are warming even faster. In my own province of British Columbia, wildfires have grown worse. The area burned by wildfires in the last two years was three times the 10-year average. The consequences of increasing income inequality or falling trust in our democratic institutions are also significant. As parliamentarians, we have a duty to act. Sustainable development is not just a question of best practice, it is a matter of protecting our constituents. That is why last month I was proud to see our parliament declare a national climate emergency in Canada and to reiterate our commitment to meeting our targets under the Paris Agreement. <coughs> Security and sustainable development are not national issues, they are global challenges. There is no question we can do more to confront climate change, strengthen institutions, improve governance, and support orderly migration if we act together. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> Mr. President. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and also, the, the keeping your comments interesting and, and uh, short, uh, and um, now, Mr. Voronetsky from Belarus, please, the floor is yours, sir. Уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые коллеги, прежде всего позвольте поблагодарить наших люксембургских коллег и секретариат парламентской ассамблеи за прекрасную организацию нашего форума. Республика Беларусь придает важное значение укреплению сотрудничества в рамках ОБСЕ повышению вклада организации в решение вопросов общеевропейской безопасности. Мы глубоко заинтересованы в снижении напряженности, углублении взаимного доверия, урегулировании конфликтов и в конечном итоге формировании надежных механизмов обеспечения региональной безопасности на пространстве нашей организации. На достижение этих целей направлен целый ряд инициатив Республики Беларусь, включая широко известное предложение главы нашего государства о возобновлении масштабного международного диалога по вопросам безопасности по аналогии с Хейсинским процессом. Беларусь глубоко привержена поиску мирного регулирования затянувшихся конфликтов на пространстве ОБСЕ. Всецело поддерживаем деятельность трехсторонней контактной группы по Украине и ее рабочих подгрупп, намерены и далее создавать все необходимые условия для переговоров любого формата по урегулированию ситуации в Украине. 
Тематика нынешней сессии позволяет сконцентрировать внимание на вопросах устойчивого развития как важные предпосылки для обеспечения мира и безопасности, а также обменяться мнениями о роли национальных парламентов в этом процессе. Со своей стороны хотели бы подчеркнуть, что Беларусь не только полностью разделяет цели устойчивого развития, но и системно работает над выполнением повестки 2030. В 2018 году по прогрессу в достижении целей устойчивого развития Беларусь заняла 23 место из 153 стран мира. В феврале прошлого года Минск принял региональный форум национальных координаторов по целям устойчивого развития, а в январе этого года состоялся первый национальный форум по устойчивому развитию. Убеждены, что дискуссии по такой важной теме и на нашей сегодняшней площадке позволят наметить общие ориентиры в контексте укрепления европейской безопасности. Белорусская делегация внесла на рассмотрение нашей сессии проект резолюции на тему «Стратегическое прогнозирование в областях науки, технологий и инноваций для устойчивого развития», которую считаем весьма актуальной и отвечающей потребностям государств-участников. Пользуясь случаем, в заключение хотел бы поблагодарить наших коллег, кто поддержал и выступил с автором белорусской резолюции и поддержал ее в профильном комитете. Рассчитываем на уважительный и конструктивный диалог по всем актуальным вопросам повестки дня сессии, без их ненужной политизации и успешного принятия Люксембургской декларации. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, Mr. Mukashev from Kazakhstan. Please, sir, floor is yours. Уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые коллеги, Позвольте приветствовать участников 28-й ежегодной сессии Парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ. Тематика данной сессии – содействие устойчивому развитию в интересах укрепления безопасности. Роль парламента отражает главный тезис Астанинской декларации ОБСЕ, в котором говорится, что безопасность каждого государства, участника ОБСЕ, неразрывно связана с безопасностью всех других государств. На фоне роста современных вызовов и угроз на пространстве ОБСЕ данный тезис становится все более актуальным. Мы считаем, что крупнейшая в мире региональная организация по безопасности должна служить площадкой для открытого диалога и повышения взаимопонимания и укрепления сотрудничества в общем и неделимом евроатлантическом и евразийском сообществе безопасности, как это было заявлено в Астанинской декларации ОБСЕ. За дни работы Ассамблеи мы приняли ряд резолюций на важнейшие актуальные темы, среди которых возвращение иностранных боевиков-террористов. В этом контексте хотел бы э, отметить э, э, операцию, гуманитарную операцию ЖУСАН-2, которая была осуществлена Казахстаном. В ходе реализации удалось вывести из зон боевых действий в Сирии 231 казахстанца, в том числе 16 мужчин. 59 женщин, 156 детей. Уважаемые члены Ассамблеи, с начала 2019 года в Казахстане разворачиваются глубокие процессы трансформации. Казахстан вступил в новый этап своего развития. 9 июня 2019 года состоялись конкурентные выборы президента Республики Казахстан. На выборах было аккредитовано 1013 международных наблюдателей, и 227 журналистов. Мы благодарны господину Царители, который лично посетил Казахстан в качестве координатора краткосрочных наблюдателей, а также главе миссии парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ э, госпоже Кинер Нейлен за их высокий профессионализм и конструктивный подход. Казахстан намерен продолжать тесно сотрудничать с ОБСЕ в этом направлении. Следует отметить, что избранный президент Казахстана Касмжумар Токаев является убежденным реформатором, заявившим, что без политических преобразований Казахстан не станет успешным, без политических реформ не будет прогресса в экономических реформах. Одним из первых решений президента на своем посту было учреждение Национального совета общественного доверия, который станет коммуникационной площадкой между властью и различными представителями общественности. К работе Совета будут широко привлечены все общественно-политические силы, в том числе и молодежь. Первое совещание Совета запланировано на август 2019 года. 
Вместе с тем мы сохраняем преемственность внутриполитического курса и продолжение конституционной реформы, в рамках которой значительный объем полномочий президента был перераспределен в пользу парламента и правительства. Сильный, авторитетный, многопартийный парламент, развитые институты гражданского общества – это магистральный путь дальнейшей политической модернизации. Казахстан является молодым государством, преобразование в котором будет происходить не революционным, а эволюционным путем. Мы высоко ценим существующие отношения с ОБСЕ, включая парламентскую ассамблею, и готовы к дальнейшему развитию нашего конструктивного и взаимовыгодного сотрудничества. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, just to say that we will continue to work uh, with your authorities, with Kazakhstan, with the civil society to, to implement those reforms which are important for this country, especially after elections and election of new president. So uh, next speaker, next speaker, Mr. Vogt from Liechtenstein. Thank you, President. Good morning, my dear and Herren. Liechtenstein bedankt sich für die Durchführung der Jahrestagung der OSZE hier in Luxemburg. Die Sicherheitslage im OSZE-Raum bleibt weiterhin sehr angespannt und die Arbeit der Organisation ist gerade auch bezüglich der bestehenden Konflikte besonders relevant. Liechtenstein unterstützt die drei Hauptschwerpunkte des slowakischen Vorsitzes über Konflikte und Auswirkungen auf betroffene Menschen, das Schaffen einer sicheren Zukunft und den effektiven Multilateralismus. Im Ansatz, ambitiös und gleichzeitig realistisch zu sein, kann ein Weg zur Lösung dieses Anliegens sein. Liechtenstein hat Ende 2018 freiwillige Beiträge zur Unterstützung des slowakischen Vorsitzes geleistet. Die Krim-Annexion und der Konflikt in der Ostukraine haben Aufrüstungstendenzen in Ost und West verstärkt und das ohnehin geringe Interesse der Großmächte an einer konventionellen Rüstungskontrolle hat weiterhin abgenommen. Der Krieg zwischen Russland und der Ukraine ist leider zu einem Dauerzustand geworden. Es scheint, dass aufgrund dessen, dass in der Ostukraine mittlerweile weniger Menschen sterben als noch vor drei Jahren, eine gewisse Gewöhnung dieser Situation eingetroffen zu sein. Und wir sind sehr besorgt über die Situation der zivilen Bevölkerung in all diesen Konfliktgebieten. Sich für die Legitimation eines solchen Krieges auch noch auf die UN-Charta zu beziehen, ist ein inakzeptabler Zustand und fordert diese Organisation in einem besonderen Maße. Erschweren wirkt auch der ausgesetzte INF-Vertrag über die nuklearen Mittelstreckensysteme. Diese Ausgangslage macht es für die OSZT sehr schwierig, unterstreicht aber die Bedeutung als Dialogplattform zu den Sicherheitsfragen. Liechtenstein begrüßt unter der Schirmherrschaft der Minsker Gruppe entstandene Gesprächsbereitschaft auf Außenministerebene zwischen Armenien und Aserbaidschan. Der strukturierte Dialog ist weiterhin einer der wichtigsten Prozesse in der OSZT. Leider ist dieser Dialog aufgrund der aktuellen sicherheitspolitischen Spannung in Stocken geraten. Liechtenstein verfolgt und unterstützt die Wichtigkeit des strukturierten Dialoges und wird sich zu diesem Thema aktiv und konstruktiv in die OSZT weiterhin einbringen. Nochmals meinen besten Dank an die Freunde aus Luxemburg für diese wirklich hervorragend organisierte Jahrestagung. Danke. Give me the, sorry. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Mr. Thornson from Iceland, please. Uh, Mr. President, uh, it's Svensson. Mr. President, uh, it's uh, sorry, Margaret. Please, it's okay. It's Svensson. 
Not, not Thorson Svensson, but it's okay. But it's, uh, here we had, uh, we had in this list Mr. Mr. Thorson. Yeah, it's, it's just a mistake on our yeah, side. Yeah, there's uh, two of them yes, are okay. in different places, but please go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. President, I would like to thank our friends from Luxembourg for hosting us and the Minister for Foreign Affairs for a reception on Saturday in an ex exceptionally beautiful place. The Minister gave a good speech and reminded us of our role and duties. I would also like to thank Dr. Hetty Frey for her work as a special representative on gender issues and for her endless struggle for equality, not only for women and youth, but for everyone who does not enjoy those rights that most of us take for granted. Equality is human rights. It is human rights to be involved in society and it's our role and the role of the OECEPA to fight diligently for it. I, it, does not, it does not matter whether you are a woman or a man, a girl or a boy, a homosexual or heterosexual, disabled or not, black or white, Muslim or Christian, or whatever societal position you have, we should all be equal. Dear colleagues, I ask you, do you care about the rights of your mothers, sisters and daughters? Are they not entitled to the same quality of life as a man? Homosexuals are persecuted around the world. Would you turn your back on a daughter or a son if their sexuality was different from yours? Intolerance and persecution, no matter in what form, cannot be allowed to shape our communities. Extremists and fanatics must not prevail. If you didn't hear the speech of Mr. Bethel, the Prime Minister of Luxembourg here in this chamber on Thursday, then I encourage you to watch it on YouTube. Mr. President, we must not give up the battle continues against stereotyping, intolerance, and extremists around the world. We, the states of OSCPA, must live up to our commitments and values and be ex exemplary. The task is not completed. And I know that the fire that burns inside Haiti Fry will continue to ignite the fight in the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and next speaker in our list, uh, Ms. Shapaska from North Macedonia. Thank you, Mr. President, dear colleagues. My country, the Republic of North Macedonia, adopted its national strategy for sustainable development in 2010, and additionally, the National Council for Sustainable Development was established as an advisory body. Yeah, okay. The Council is chaired by Vice President of the Government and comprises Ministers, representatives from the Chamber of Commerce, the Universities, the Academy of Science and Art, the non-governmental sector, as well as two Members of Parliament. We, as parliamentarians, should do everything in our power to stimulate sustainable development by employing a suited legal framework and scrutiny over governmental activities and national and global policies with the overall objective of promoting security and economic growth, reducing unemployment and poverty, and advancing social well-being. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to briefly address the situation in my country, the Republic of North Macedonia. EU and NATO membership, good neighborly relations and regional cooperation remain our strategic goals. I would like to take this opportunity and remind you of the two key agreements the Republic of Macedonia concluded to resolve the bilateral issues with the neighbors. The agreement of friendship, good neighborly relations and cooperation with the Republic of Bulgaria and the PRESPA agreement with Greece. These two agreements represent a historic turning point in bilateral relations in the region and therefore unlock the potential for the progress of sincere partnership based on support and cooperation in all areas of mutual interest. Our report, reform efforts were recognized in the European Commission's last report on the country's progress in the EU integration process. The European Commission gave a clear, unconditional recommendation that my country will start the negotiation with the EU, and furthermore, the country was indefinite as a bright example in the whole region. With the conclusion of the EU Council of Ministers held here in Luxembourg last month, we received a strong acknowledgement of, of our achievement in the past year. 
That is why our citizens expect that our country, North Macedonia, will receive a date for starting negotiation with the European Union as a well-deserved chance following the progress the country made in many areas. The opening of EU accession negotiation will uh, include a liar guarantee of maintaining domestic stability and continuing the reform impulse in North Macedonia, which will have positive impact of the entire region. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have some difficulties because not many people in the room. Some speakers are out, so we're trying to find people who are first in the room. And I have some also additional requests from the floor. So I guess we will manage. Uh, now, um, Mr. Nabi Avci from uh, Turkey, head of Turkish delegation, please, and followed by Ms. Katsarava from Georgia. Dear Chair, first of all, I would like to thank on behalf of the Turkish delegation to, the, to Luxembourg for the warm hospitality. Dear colleagues, migration and also irregular migration is one of our main concerns. As you, are, as you all well aware, Turkey has opened its doors to millions of people fleeing the conflicts in Syria. And Turkey is now host over 4 million refugees, 3.6 of them Syrians. I would like to underscore that Turkey has spent more than $37 billion for refugees, according to the UN calculations. Just a few countries like Turkey and Jordan have had to shoulder the burden of millions of irregular migrants all by themselves. Developed countries and most of the Western countries, which lecture other countries on human rights, have unfortunately failed in that fundamental test of humanity. Mr. Chairperson, many countries have witnessed the bloody face of terror in recent years. The terrorist attacks perpetrated by different terrorist organizations in Turkey, in Paris, Brussels, United States, New Zealand, and Sri Lanka, and have once again shown that the terror cannot be associated with a certain region, a certain ethnic identity, or a certain religious group. As OCPA members, we must display a principled, coherent, and determined stance on the fight against terror. It's wrong to classify terrorist organizations according to their ideologies or so-called identities. All states must ex exhibit the virtue of calling terror as terror. Unfortunately, there are significant problems and contradictions in this respect, especially in the context of Syria. Terrorist organizations such as PYD, PKK, that commit ethnic cleansing, forcefully recruit children, and force local people to migration are being held in high esteem, so to speak, by some allies of us. Formations like FETO in Turkey are harbored by some countries, pro providing protection and refugee under the guise of political asylum the pushes that have targeted our democracy. Just as terrorist organizations like Daesh and Al-Qaeda pose a threat to, a, to global security, so are the neo-Nazi formations dangerous to the same extent as we witnessed in the, des in the massacre in New Zealand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, the, the Chairman. Um, and um, now, Ms. Katsarava, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, at the Political Affairs and Security Committee, majority uh, of you voted and adopted the resolution 
initiated by the Georgian delegation, security and human rights situation in Abkhazia, Georgia, and Srinwali region, South Ossetia, Georgia. I once again would like to remind all of you today that almost three decades have passed since the start of the conflict and that Russia still remains in breach of international obligations and of every provision of the EU-mediated 12 August 2008 ceasefire agreement. Precisely because we represent people back in our countries, I speak for those, again, who haven't continued to suffer the consequences of the war and appeal today in this chamber again to stand together and find a solution to the underlying problem. Hundreds of thousands of people expelled from their homes in Abkhazia and Srinwali regions live in protracted displacement for over decades. And those residing in the occupied territories live in constant discrimination on ethnic grounds, whose rights and fundamental rights are gravely violated. Dear colleagues, I did mention it yesterday and I would like to reiterate it again. No matter how difficult it is to overcome decades of divergences, we will continue to find avenues for the peaceful resolution of the Russia-Georgia conflict in line with the international law and Helsinki principles. It is with this spirit that my government pursues and strongly supports the peace initiative aimed at improving the humanitarian and socio-economic conditions of people residing in Abkhazia and Srinwali region, as well as fostering people-to-people -people contacts and confidence building between the divided communities. It is with such forward-looking initi initiatives that we seek a way ahead and we need strong support of the international community in our pursuit to the peaceful resolution of the conflict. I once again thank all our colleagues, those who responded yesterday to this res resolution by their remarks and by voting and adopting the resolution. I once again thank the hosts uh, of the assembly here and I would like to encourage everybody, all of you in this room, to support this important resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, uh, Mr. Nikolai Rizak, followed by Ms. Sommer, Sommer from Germany. Благодарю вас, господин председатель. Мы присоединяемся к теплым словам в адрес организаторов этого крупного политического форума. Действительно, все было сделано на высоком уровне, и мы все ощутили радушие хозяев. А теперь несколько слов по существу обсуждаемой темы. Я напомню уважаемым коллегам, что именно Советский Союз был одним из организаторов и инициаторов проведения Хельсинского совещания. И мы очень дорожим той политической площадкой, парламентской ассамблеей, которая позволяет выстраивать систему коллективной безопасности. Вы, наверное, заметили, что мы с достоинством восприняли ряд политических инсинуаций, которые были высказаны в наш адрес. Позволю напомнить лишь некоторые из них. Обсуждается вопрос об энергетической безопасности, о дезинфицификации, что, собственно, имеет законное право. Виновата Россия. Мало того, еще и коррупцию за собой ведет. Обсуждается вопрос о военных частных компаниях. Виновата Россия. Я напомню, что именно такой подход, он не способствует формированию и выработке общей позиции и нахождению тех конструктивных моментов, которые позволят разрешить конфликты. Мы с большим удовлетворением и с сдержанным оптимизмом думаем, что новая власть на Украине, есть к этому предпосылки, пойдет другим путем и воспримет те конструктивные предложения, которые исходят с российской стороны. Намечается проведение телемоста – что не было уже в течение пяти лет. Сейчас Зеленский вместе с представителем Европейских институтов Дональдом Туском посетили районы боевых действий. Я думаю, что последует дальнейшее разведение тяжелых орудий. То есть есть какие-то моменты, которые позволяют нам решать эти вопросы. Но если мы без конца будем обвинять и слышать эти обвинения, мы терпеливо реагируем на них. Но может же быть как какой-то предел всему этому? 
Я хотел бы напомнить, что весь мир содрогался, когда темное пятно ИГИЛ распространялось на карте. И все думали, где же та сила, которая его остановит. И эта сила нашлась. Мы в опоре на здравые силы на Ближнем Востоке сумели вместе победить ИГИЛ. Но ростки, очаги терроризма распространяются дальше. Мы должны думать и над этим, а не обвинять без конца в Россию. Надо же в конце концов уметь демонстрировать здравый смысл. Поэтому я надеюсь, что мы готовы и еще раз подтверждаем свою конструктивную направленность на выработку всех политических решений только мирным путем. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Ms. Sommer, uh, followed by Pia Kaumo from Finland. Sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, das ist meine zweite Jahrestagung und seit der Berliner Tagung vor einem Jahr hat sich die Situation leider nicht verbessert. Im Verhältnis der Staaten ist seitdem noch mehr Vertrauen und Sicherheit leider verloren gegangen. Ich bedauere zutiefst, dass unsere OSZE-Partner, die Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika und die Russische Föderation bislang keine Lösung gefunden haben, um den wichtigen INF-Vertrag zu retten. Der Verlust dieses wegweisenden Abrüstungsvertrags ist meines Erachtens keine Lappalie. An die Stelle des Rechts tritt zunehmend das Recht, das Recht des Stärkeren. Es wird aufgerüstet. Das Völkerrecht wird gebrochen und die Zahl der bewaffneten Konflikte nimmt zu. Kriege und Konflikte sind eine wesentliche Ursache für Fluchtbewegungen. Aktuell sind mehr als 70 Millionen Menschen auf der Flucht. Das sind so viele seit dem Ende des Zweiten Weltkriegs nicht mehr. Ich habe als einzige Abgeordnete des jetzigen Bundestages eine eigene Fluchtbiografie. Ich weiß aus eigenem Erleben, was Flucht bedeutet und vor allem, wie wichtig es ist, dass es Staaten gibt, die geflüchtete Menschen aufnehmen und ihnen Schutz gewähren. Es ist die Stärke der OSZE, Sicherheitsfragen nicht nur durch die militärische Brille zu betrachten. Allerdings muss die OSZE und müssen auch wir als Parlamentarierinnen und Parlamentarier noch entscheidender auftreten, wenn wichtige Abrüstungs- und Rüstungskontrollvereinbarungen gekündigt oder nicht eingehalten werden. Militärische Sicherheit entsteht nicht durch Ab Abrüstung, nicht durch, Aufrüst durch Aufrüstung. Wir dürfen uns selbst nicht kleiner machen, als wir es sind. Denn die Gegner von multilateralen Abkommen machen dies auch nicht. Wir brauchen Verständigung statt Konfrontation und Multilateralismus statt Nationalismus. Wir als Parlamentarierinnen und Parlamentarier müssen versuchen, Brücken zu bauen und kritische Dialoge zu führen, gerade in diesen schwierigen Zeiten. Die bewaffneten Konflikte in der OSZE zwischen OSZE-Teilnehmerstaaten müssen nach den Normen des Völkerrechts gewaltfrei gelöst werden. Die Kriegsflüchtlinge und Binnenvertriebenen haben ein Rückkehrrecht. In diesem Sinne sollten wir versuchen, an der friedlichen Lösung der Konflikte mitzuwirken. Und abschließend möchte ich mich ausdrücklich für die vertrauensvolle Atmosphäre und die kollegiale Zusammenarbeit herzlich bedanken. Vielen Dank. Thank you, thank you very much, Ms. Sommer. And now Pia Kauma. Pia Kauma followed by François Jolivet from France. Dear Mr. President, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank the whole team in Luxembourg to the, of the kind hospitality that they have offered to all of us, and you, Mr. Tseretelli, for your excellent work during the past year. Protracted conflicts, such as the one in Nagorno-Karabakh, have been the topic of many interventions during this session. These conflicts have been on our agenda for a long time, but only little progress has been made despite numerous attempts to find long-lasting solutions. 
Many models have been tried and there is no one-size-fits-all solution for conflict resolution. However, I would like to present to you one example with a positive outcome. The Orland Islands autonomy case. It came about as a result of a developing conflict between Finland and Sweden on whether Orland, a group of islands between our two countries, should be a part of Sweden or part of Finland. Under the Swedish rule, the Swedish-speaking islands had been part of Sweden, but under the Russian rule, they belonged to the Grand Duchy of Finland. The dispute over the sovereignty of the islands was brokered by the League of Nations in 1921, and both Sweden and Finland agreed to be bound by the settlement. In its final decision, the League decided on three issues, which still today are essential elements of the Åland status. Firstly, Finland maintained sovereignty over Åland. Secondly, Åland gained aut autonomy, including international guarantees for the protection of the Swedish language, own culture and local traditions. And thirdly, Sweden achieved demilitarization and neutralization of Åland, so that it would never become a military threat to Sweden. Mind you that none of the three parties involved were satisfied with the solution, and it was a compromise between independence and total integration, offering a little for everyone, just a little. The Orlanders didn't want autonomy. It was imposed on them against their will. However, this autonomy arrangement turned out to be a success story. It has evolved to be a benefit of the Orlanders and is a prime example of how autonomy can be extended over time. Dear President, the Orland case is an example of functional self-government, which could be applied to other conflicts as well. Having said that, I want to underline that no single solution can ever be universally applied to all situations. This is why I want to raise it as an example to serve as a form of inspiration. However, the Orland example has contributed to peace and stability in the Baltic Sea region and has resulted in Finland's strong belief in mediation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Pia. We need good practices, best practices to share. And it's a good example, too. Uh, next speaker I already announced, uh, it's... Uh, Mr. Francois Jolivet from France, and uh, will be followed by Terry Mercer from Canon. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président. Mes chers collègues, Cherbourg, Venborg, Maersk, Costco Nagoya, Grande America, MSC Zoé, que vous rappellent ces noms. S'ils n'ont pas laissé de traces dans votre esprit, ils en ont laissé dans les mers et océans, sur la faune et la flore, sur les rivages à court et à long terme. 1500 à 10 000 par an est le nombre estimé des containers tombés à l'eau, vides et pleins. Cette approximation est due à l'absence de référencement précis et résulte d'un croisement de chiffres entre déclarations d'armateurs, déclarations d'assurance et rapports sur le commerce mondial. Les armateurs ne déclarant pas toujours leurs pertes. Ces chutes de containers représentent une véritable catastrophe écologique en raison d'une part de la nature même du container et d'autre part de ce qu'ils contiennent. En janvier 2009, le MSC Zoé a perdu au moins 270 containers au large des Pays-Bas après avoir été pris dans une tempête. Début de février, plus de 20 000 guillemots, oiseaux de mer, ont été retrouvés morts sur les plages néerlandaises. Les scientifiques s'interrogent sur le lien entre cette hécatombe inédite et le peroxyde organique contenu et transporté dans les containers. Le Grand Day America, qui a sombré deux mois plus tard, transportait 365 containers, dont 45 répertoriés comme contenant des matières très dangereuses. En 2013, quelques semaines plus tard, après la perte de 79 containers, le Circo Nagoya a coulé et, les France, et la France et ses plages étaient recouvertes de seringues. Aussi, pour éviter cela, il conviendrait de pouvoir identifier les containers afin, en cas de perte ou de naufrage, de pouvoir savoir lesquels repêcher en priorité en raison de la, de, leur, de la dangerosité de leur contenu. Évidemment, cela se pose une déclaration de perte de la part des armateurs ou des capitaines de bateaux et aussi un contrôle à l'arrivée. Je pense que dans un objectif de sécurité et de développement durable, cette mesure peu coûteuse pourrait éviter de nombreuses pollutions et conflits, 
Ce rôle nous incombe à nous, parlementaires, et correspond tout à fait au thème de notre session d'aujourd'hui, le rôle des parlements pour encourager, encourager le développement durable et promouvoir la sécurité. Si l'objectif de la politique est de procurer une vie meilleure aux générations futures, faisons en sorte de ne pas laisser nos poubelles symbole d'une génération, la nôtre, qui n'a pas su faire ou qui s'est trompée. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, and now, as I already announced from Canada, our colleague, Mr. Terry Mercer, and uh, after our Romanian colleague, Mr. Lucian Romasan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, colleagues, uh, join this open uh, debate. I'd like to turn our attention uh, for a moment to fr freedom of expression, freedom of the media, and the internet freedom uh, given the rise to uh, of uh, disinformation campaigns and propaganda that are so common in our times. The right to freedom of expression in the opinion of, uh, of population is, is founded upon the ability uh, to access information and form opinions based on facts. As, uh, as has been highlighted by UNESCO, free media play, play, a, crit uh, play a critical role in building consensus, sharing information, both the central to democratic decision-making and, and to social development. Disinformation and propaganda smother freedom of expression by speaking over free media and, and obscuring uh, independent information. Disinformation is increasingly pre prevalent. UNESCO has cautioned that they turned uh, towards populism and nationalism since 2012 has been has been especially damaging to freedom of the, uh, of the media. Attempts by states to control media have led democracy watchdog freedom hosts to warn that globally we are experiencing the highest levels of repression of the press in a decade. Adding uh, to the concern is the tendency for this disinformation and propaganda to go hand in hand with steps taken to silence independent media. Mindful of this, in April, The uh, OSCE uh, held meetings uh, to address the safety of, uh, of journalists. The OSCE, a special representative on freedom of the media, also noted in his uh, uh, November 22nd, 2018 report to the Permanent Council, in interventions of his, uh, his office had taken uh, regarding violence against uh, media workers. Violence against journalists is is but one of the current uh, trends in media freedom. The OSCE uh, representative on fr freedom of the media has also noted other methods of, of repression and silencing uh, independent media. For example, criminal uh, defamation laws that punish journalists for exposing wrongdoing and corruption. So other, another one is continuing limitations uh, to free expression online. Planting the seeds of mistrust of the media, well, waves of uh, disinformation and the, and the disintegration of safe and independent media environments uh, un undermine our democratic systems and further uh, uh, violations of human rights. We must all act together as parliamentarians to protect these important freedoms. I thank you, colleagues, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Mr. Lucien Romascano from Romania, and then uh, Vladimir Gorchev <coughs> from North Macedonia, please. Dear Mr. President, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am much honored to have the opportunity to say a few words with the occasion of the 28th Annual Session of the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSC. I will start by thanking you all for supporting the election of our Romanian colleagues, Mr. Dunava as Vice Chair of the First Committee and Mr. Dobre as Vice President. They are dedicated and will serve with energy and competence the OSCPA from these positions. Also, please receive Romania's delegation gratitude for supporting our amendments and proposals related to the Republic of Moldova. Moldova needs all our support on their way to peace and prosperity as a European country. Secondly, I want to revisit my yesterday intervention during the first committee session. Due to probably a timing issue, there were some misinterpretations of my words, so I want to be very clear. Romania has a balanced approach when it comes to peaceful resolution of the conflicts in the OSCE area. 
peace being the only outcome acceptable. For all situations, and Nagorno-Karabakh is included, we support the full compliance with the Helsinki Final Act provisions and the inviolability of the frontiers, and we encourage all constructive dialogue. In this respect, I restate the fact that OSCEPA meetings are the best opportunity to have dialogue between parties when there are different opinions. I would be happy to see resolutions and amendments negotiated and signed by countries that before had different visions on an issue or another. I state here <clears throat> the availability of the Romanian delegation to mediate between different parties when this approach could prove helpful, and I encourage other delegations to act the same. I end my intervention with our warmest thanks for the Luxembourg team and to all our hosts for their perfect organizing of this session and for their kind hospitality. Also, special thanks to Roberto and his team for their efforts. I look forward to meeting you in Bucharest in 2021. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much, and we're looking forward to come to Romania for our session. Thanks again for, for this plan and your decision. And now, Mr. Gyorcha from North Macedonia, followed by Mr. Torobai from Kyrgyzstan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would like to give big compliments to our host from Luxembourg. I think we really had a productive session and it was really a unique experience to have a first-hand experience and impression about the success that Luxembourg as a country had in the last 30 or 40 years. If you see the transformation of Luxembourg from a country that was uh, basically relying just on steel and industries and what has developed in the Luxembourg from the 70s and the 80s is nothing less than advancement and progress worth complementing. I would also like to stress the positive role that the OSC plays and our organization is growing. The issues that we are addressing are important and also I would like to compliment uh, the whole leadership of the OSCPA as well as the participants that are adding to the table with their fruitful discussions. Uh, I would like to stress the importance of bilateral cooperation between ourselves. So let's use this multilateral platform for bigger, stronger bilateral cooperation. We know each other, we can talk, we can talk in official capacity, we can talk between the events, so let's make most of it. Further, I would like to stress the importance of the Western Balkan countries' accession to the European Union. All, all, all Western Balkan countries are willing to join the European Union, so my appeal from the EU countries would be, please keep the open door policy open, keep the door open, and let's have our countries closer and closer to the EU. I would especially make an appeal to our German colleagues, Dutch colleagues, French colleagues, and other parliament colleagues to keep this issue open. At the end, uh, Mr. President, I would like to say that my country, Macedonia, has a lot of problems. We have problems with the economy, rule of law, media freedom, political persecution, and so on and so forth. But these European ideas are keeping us together. Let's keep our young people in our countries. Many people are leaving due to poor economic conditions from the region, including Macedonia. But let's make the future better. Many thanks for our hosts once again for Luxembourg welcoming us, and I wish a successful work and voting the draft uh, Luxembourg de Declaration in this plenary. Thank you very much. Thank you, De Vladimir. Uh, now, Mr. Torobay, followed by Akdak Rajab from Turkey. Уважаемый председатель, уважаемые коллеги, На территории Центральной Азии расположены многочисленные урановые и химические хвостохранилища, содержащие значительные объемы высокотоксичных урановых и других крайне опасных отходов. Состояние некоторых урановых хвостохранилищ значительно ухудшилось после закрытия производств. Имеющие риски значительно возрастают. В целом существует реальный риск возникновения серьезной катастрофы для населенных пунктов и трансграничных рек расположенных вблизи хвостохранилищ, а также есть угроза для Ферганской долины с населением 12 миллионов человек. 
Кыргызская Республика в сотрудничестве с заинтересованными странами и ключевыми международными партнерами работает над поиском эффективных мер для предотвращения угрожающей катастрофы. Кыргызская Республика в вопрос экологии в целом и хвостохранилищ в частности неоднократно был обозначен в качестве одной из важных приоритетов в ходе выступления на сессии Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН и страна инициировала предложение о принятии Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН специальной резолюции по проблемам уранового наследия в Центральной Азии и, по, и получила полную поддержку мирового сообщества. В 2017 году Кыргызская Республика вновь выступила с инициативой обновления резолюции Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН под названием «Роль международного сообщества предотвращения радиационной угрозы в Центральной Азии» с тем, чтобы выйти на новый этап. Состоялись ряд международных форумов высокого уровня по проблемам урановых хостохранений в Центральной Азии. Данная проблема поднималась на сессии технические опасности от снижения рисков к восстановлению в рамках Третьей Всемирной конференции ООН. Уважаемые коллеги, масштабы и риски, связанные с проблемой урановых хостохранилищ, требуют ее перевода в плоскость практических действий. Кыргызская республика и другие страны СНГ, принимая во внимание угрозы возможных природных или техногенных катастроф и глобальные последствия для жизни и здоровья людей, в рамках принятых ими международных обязательств в 2013 году утвердили межгосударственную целевую программу под названием «Рекультивация территории государств, подвергшихся воздействию уранодобывающих производств». В связи с этим вопросы координации и консолидации Усилия стран региона и других заинтересованных государств нуждаются в дополнительном обсуждении и выработке рекомендаций на предстоящие годы в рамках парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ. Уважаемые коллеги ассамблеи, Кыргызская республика надеется, что благодаря усиленному вниманию международного сообщества к данным проблемам удастся предотвратить экологические риски регионального масштаба, риски гуманитарного кризиса обеспечить устойчивое развитие стран региона Центральной Азии и предотвратить риски использования радиоактивных отходов в целях экстремизма и терроризма. Благодарю за внимание. I would like to highlight an important issue relevant to human dimension first. Turkey attaches utmost importance to the OEC human dimension events, as well as to the participation of representatives of civil society in these meetings. However, we should not allow the abuse of such an opportunity by terrorist elements. Groups and individuals affiliated to the Fatwa terror organization which tried to destroy the Turkish democracy and which continues to pose an existential threat to Turkey were allowed to participate in human dimension meetings before, disguising themselves as civil society actors. This is against the OEC's own rules and past practice. Human dimension meetings have to remain as a platform for the exchange of opinions and dialogue with the civil society not with terrorist entities. Second, a few days ago, UN Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict, Virginia Gamba, met with a PKK terrorist who command the so-called Syrian Democratic Forces to sign an action plan. This is a grave incident. We strongly condemn it. The crimes perpetrated by the PYDYPG have been well documented by reports of independent institutions. This terrorist organization has committed against children the gravest violation of international law and forced them to engage in military conflict. It is, however, unacceptable that the UN has taken a terrorist organization with blood on its hands as an interlocutor to address this problem. We should be resolute and consistent in our fight against terrorism. Thank you.
Thank you, Teshikura Rederim. And now, I'll tell you who is the next speaker, oh, Daniel, the reader. I already announced it and uh, uh, will be followed by Mr. Johannes Koskinen from Finland. Ja, vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Auch ich möchte mich im Namen der deutschen Delegation ganz, ganz herzlich für die hervorragende Organisation unserer Luxemburger Gastgeber bedanken. Frieden ist mehr als die Abwesenheit von Krieg. Und deshalb kommen wir Deutschen immer stets sehr gerne zu den OSZE-Konferenzen. Sie wissen vielleicht, dass Deutschland nach den USA der zweitgrößte Zahler und das zweitgrößte Geberland der OSZE ist. Und denken Sie uns einmal weg, dann würden der OSZE 11 Prozent Ihres Haushaltes fehlen. Deshalb gestatten Sie mir, dass ich darauf hinweise, dass wir auch in unserem nationalen Parlament stets gefragt werden, was bringt es eigentlich, bei der OSZE Mitglied zu sein. Mein Bericht wird wie folgt lauten. Wir haben viel Hoffnung, dass etwa in Aserbaidschan und Armenien die Konflikte lösbar sind. Das hängt auch damit zusammen, dass viele junge Leute sich davon distanzieren, dass Krieg, Hass und Wut die Generation ihrer Eltern und Großeltern geprägt hat. An anderer Stelle treten wir aber auf der Stelle. Das gilt beispielsweise für die Ukraine und das ist höchst bedauerlich und daran müssen wir weiterarbeiten, denn die OSZE muss weiterhin dafür kämpfen, dass Werte wie Vertrauen, Dialog, Schutz und Toleranz Ihren, äh, ihren Esprit ausmachen. Und damit meine ich nicht nur den Spirit von Helsinki. Vergessen wir aber bitte nicht, dass Kriege sich auch verändern, dass Kriege hybrid werden und sich in ihren zeitlichen Verläufen etwa ändern, dass Kriege und Auseinandersetzungen verschleppt werden. Es bedarf heute keiner Kriegserklärung mehr, um zwischen den Völkern Unfrieden zu, scha zu schaffen. Vergessen Sie bitte auch nicht, dass Propaganda und Fake News zu kriegerischen Auseinandersetzungen führen, deren Dimensionen wir heute noch gar nicht ermessen können und dass die Gefahr atomarer Auseinandersetzungen etwa mit Blick auf den INF-Vertrag wieder en vogue sind. Auch manchen Kollegen, manche Kollegin muss man vielleicht daran erinnern, dass zum Völkerrecht auch Werte und Moral gehören und das hat nichts Antiquiertes oder Umständlich oder Altes. Und einen letzten Punkt lassen Sie mich bitte noch erwähnen. Es geht in der Auseinandersetzung um Gender und möglicherweise in der Auseinandersetzung um Geschlecht nicht nur darum, dass wir Frauen zählen. Wir wollen, dass Frauen zählen und in wichtige Positionen gelangen und dass auch die Antiquierten und Geschlechterstereotype für Männer und Jungen aufgehoben werden. Denn das ist auch ein ganz wesentlicher Kampf, den wir noch zu führen haben. Ich bin hoffnungsvoll, dass die junge Generation, die wir hier in der OSZE stärker werden partizipieren lassen müssen, dieses lösen werden. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much for your interesting intervention, dear Daniela. And now, Mr. Koskinen, followed by Mr. Chubarov from Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, dear colleagues. Both in the plenary and the committees we have discussed and voted on the numerous protracted conflicts of our OSCE regions. It is of utmost importance that we as parliamentarians are active promoters of sustainable solutions to the conflicts, not actors of disturbance. To serve this purpose, I think we should reinforce our working methods to focus more on constructive preparation of common combining views and actions to reach more positive results and impact. To take a positive example, our delegation welcomes recent encouraging contacts between Armenia and Azerbaijan on the peaceful resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, including the first official meeting between Prime Minister Pashinyan and President Aliyev in March. We also welcome the identified need to take concrete measures to prepare the populations for peace. Parliamentarians should have a key role in that. Lasting peace would bring great benefits, not only in terms of security, but also in terms of economic development across the whole region. The recent contacts are encouraging, but we remain very concerned about the conflict of Nagorno-Karabakh and urge sites to take all necessary measures to prevent any escalation in the conflict zone. 
As a member of the Minsk group, Finland fully supports the efforts of the group and the co-chairs to mediate the conflict. Mediation is one of the priorities of Finland's foreign policy. We want to strengthen mediation activities of the OSCE and its parliamentary assembly to speed up conflict resolution processes. We emphasize inclusiveness, local ownership, and the role of women and the civil society. We also place a high value on the dialogue among cultures and religions. We have taken steps to the right direction, and we must continue that. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's very appropriate that we have also finished special rapid mediation and the OSCPA. Uh, Mr. Chubarov, please, floor is yours, followed by Ms. Serova from Russia. Уважаемый господин председатель, в течение нескольких дней сессии нам удалось рассмотреть очень важные вопросы. Я благодарю всех коллег за поддержку украинских инициатив и проектов и призываю всех нас консолидированно за них проголосовать. Разумеется, обсуждение вопросов было непростым, но все проходило в пределах норм человеческого общения, за исключением одной ситуации, которая случилась в ходе четвертого заседания Общего комитета по демократии, правам человека и гуманитарным вопросам. В своем выступлении представитель российской делегации, реагируя на выступление других ораторов о чудовищных преступлениях коммунистического режима бывшего СССР, заявил следующее. Я цитирую. «Да, действительно, мы признаем, мы были вынуждены депортировать часть населения, некоторую часть, потому что кто-то из коллаборантов поддерживал фашистские режимы. Конец цитаты. Не знаю, как для вас, коллеги, но для меня при таком утверждении, оправдывающем преступление против человечности, чем являются насильственные депортации народов, в зале возникли зловещие силуэты Сталина и Гитлера. Они с восхищением смотрели на российскую делегацию. В годы Второй мировой войны 10 народов на территории бывшего СССР были подвергнуты тотальной депортации, в том числе и крымско-татарский народ. Наш народ потерял около половины своей численности в местах изгнания от болезней, жестоких условий выживания. Кроме этого, десятками тысяч были депортированы поляки, украинцы, литовцы, латыши, эстонцы. И этот перечень можно долго продолжать. Что касается членов российской делегации, оправдывающих преступления против человечности, мы тут ничего иного не ожидали. Но мы возмущены тем, что председательствующая на комитете не сделала замечания по поводу такого чудовищного выступления одного из, делегатов российской, одного из членов российской делегации. Уважаемые коллеги, я призываю и впредь, чтобы в нашем зале не допускались утверждения, которые противоречат всем принципам гуманитарных таких позиций. И последнее. Здесь звучат призывы о том, что давайте поговорим с таким московским акцентом. Мы готовы говорить. Мы будем говорить, но мы будем говорить лишь о путях вывода российских войск из оккупированного украинского Крыма, о путях вывода бандитских формирований, поддерживаемых Российской Федерацией из отдельных районов Донецкой и Луганской областей и о компенсации тех чудовищных утрат, которые понесли украинские территории и граждане Украины в результате российской оккупации и российской агрессии. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you. Now, now Ms. Serova from Russia, and then I'd like to ask for to Mr. Tigran Urikhanian from Armenia. Благодарю вас. Уважаемые коллеги, позвольте высказать свой протест против русофобской риторики, которая звучит здесь снова и снова, голословная и ничем не подкрепленная. В этом зале украинская сторона позволяет себе, размахивая непонятными буклетами, истерично и голословно обвинять Россию, в то время как украинская армия совершает настоящий геноцид против собственного населения. И это не голословные обвинения, это реальные факты. 
с борта Международной космической станции. Невооруженным глазом мне довелось увидеть, как рвались бомбы и снаряды на территории Донбасса и Луганска. И они летели со стороны расположения вооруженных сил Украины. А в то время там гибли безоружные люди, женщины, старики и дети. Властям Украины неинтересна безопасность собственного народа. Им нужен конфликт. Нестабильность на Украине необходима для того, чтобы травить Россию, внедрять русофобские настроения, тем самым скрывая собственные военные преступления. Но многие солдаты Украины уже разобрались, что происходит у них на родине. Это братоубийственная война. Подобную войну третьи страны пытались развязать с помощью Грузии в Абхазии и Южной Осетии, что привело бы к рекам крови. Украинские солдаты уже откровенно саботируют подобный ужас и дезертируют из рядов украинской армии, не желая иметь ничего общего с украинским антинародным режимом, который также активно поддерживается третьими странами, прикрываясь демократическими ценностями, в кавычках, и активно внедряя националистические настроения среди молодежи. Но недавние выборы на Украине очень точно показали настроение украинского народа. Они устали от лжи, обмана и братоубийственной войны. Каждый день я слышу слова благодарности от жителей Абхазии и Южной Осетии в адрес России, которая не допустила кровопролития во время ужасных событий, спровоцированных агрессией со стороны Грузии. В моей стране есть поговорка «Кто громче всех кричит «Держи вора», тот сам им и является». Что касается Крыма, там прошли настоящие демократические выборы, демократическое голосование. И именно народ сделал свой выбор, нравится вам это или нет. Это и есть настоящая свобода, слова и демократия. Американский журналист, недавно побывавший в Крыму и написавший правду, подверся травле в своей собственной стране. Это, по-вашему, свобода слова? Россия – это великая держава, самодостаточная и миролюбивая. Мы никогда и ни на кого не нападали, мы лишь защищали братские народы и своих соседей. Именно поэтому Бог всегда будет хранить мою страну, мою Россию. Мы надеемся, что новые власти Украины сделают соответствующие выводы и возобладает здравый смысл. Спасибо за внимание. Well, in this situation, of course, I will not misuse my power as a chairman to respond to you on different topics. It's my, not my mandate at this moment, but I'd like to recommend you once again to my colleague, this delegation, also all the delegation, to look very well to the resolutions which this assembly adopted, and many others too, when talking about Abkhazia, about Ossetia, and about all Ukraine and so on. That's my recommendation only. Thank you. Now, 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 I'd like to ask our Armenian colleague, Tigran Urhanyan, followed by Mr. Dalville from Canada. Уважаемые дамы и господа, специфика нашей организации – вопросы безопасности. Безопасность и стремление к укреплению безопасности на пространстве ОБСЕ. Когда в рамках наших работ мы задумываемся о неких призывах, исходящих из определенных уст, о захвате нашей столицы, Приходится к этому относиться со смехом, одновременно и с озабоченностью. Еще на берлинской сессии я говорил о том, что направленное оружие в регионе ОБСЕ является не только непосредственной угрозой в отношении многочисленных человеческих жизней, но и в адрес нашей с вами организации. Беспрецедентные скопление военной техники, военных человеческих ресурсов, строительные работы и учения, заранее не задекларированные широкомасштабные военные учения, которые, на мой взгляд, являются естественно игнором в отношении мировой общественности, на нашей площадке проявляются в виде однобоких документов, противоречащих духу и принципам, Организации по безопасности и сотрудничеству Европы, всей логике деятельности Минской группы ОБСЕ и многочисленным международным правовым актам. Однако я хочу с радостью отметить, что парламентская ассамблея ОБСЕ, оставаясь на высоте своего мандата, 
проявила непоколебимую приверженность нейтралитету и объективизму, выступая с позиций и принципов конструктивного диалога и взаимодействия исключительно в целях реального решения проблематично стоящих перед нами вопросов. Я хочу поблагодарить, пользуясь случаем, всех тех наших коллег, которые на Первом комитете проголосовали за справедливое, нейтральное, объективное и непредвзятое стремление к реализации высокого мандата Парламентской Ассамблеи ОБСЕ. Благодарю. Thank you. And uh, now Mr. Sark Dalival from Canada, followed by Mr. Nabizadeh from Azerbaijan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, I'm Suk Dalival, a member of parliament from uh, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, in fact, I just wanted to touch on the immigration uh, that, uh, you know, we have discussed here. In fact, uh, it's, it's great to see uh, that this topic uh, was made part of the discussions. Uh, you know, when I look at, at Canada, you know, I, I went to Canada as an immigrant uh, as well. Uh, in fact, uh, if we look beside the, the indigenous peoples, uh, Canada is built by immigrants. Uh, time to time, uh, you know, immigrants from different parts of the world moved to, to Canada. You know, they worked hard with, with determination and, and, and strength and, uh, and put Canada uh, as, a, as a world leader uh, on, the, on the map. Uh, you know, when I see uh, all signing those free trades that we are signing now across uh, uh, nations, uh, it is also important to consider immigration policies uh, that will not only be a, a social policy, in fact, it will become an economic policy as it uh, did in, in Canada, and where I personally see that the permanent, uh, because some of the European nations, uh, you know, they have immigration, but when it comes to uh, family class immigration, so as to attract the best people uh, around, uh, you need that policy incorporated uh, into into the into the policies that that we develop, and uh, and I do appreciate. Uh, some of the nations that has taken leadership, uh, uh, you know, having refugees, uh, you know, some more than others, uh, but we, as a, as a, as a globe, as a nation, uh, in 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 Canada, we are very proud of our our uh, uh, immigration uh, policies uh, because whether it's the economic stream, whether it's uh, students coming in, whether it's taking uh, refugees, or it is uh, uh, the family class immigration that, that I talked. Uh, so appreciate uh, me giving uh, a chance to share my words. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Nabizadeh from Azerbaijan, followed by Mr. Onishenko from Russia. Mr. Chair, dear colleagues, we had very fruitful discussions about the importance of energy-related cooperation in promoting good relations between states in the OEC area. Azerbaijan is one of the energy-rich countries of the region with advanced energy infrastructure and system. During last 27 years of independence, energy policy and common strategy of oil fields exploration and transportation of energy resources was developed. One of the common points between Azerbaijan and its partners in the energy sector, security policies, pipeline safety issue. Given the fact that all pipeline projects are passing through neighboring countries aimed at European markets, security of pipelines in, is enforcing by the all participating sites. We can say that Azerbaijan and the Caspian region to establish a new co-basin have a key role in diversifying Europe's energy supply. In this context, the different pipelines passing through Georgia, Ukraine, and Turkey to eastern side of Europe appear as concrete projects. Without doubt, Azerbaijan's close strategic connections with the countries of these roads create geostrategic and geopolitical synergies from the viewpoint of energy supplier countries. Summarizing my speech, I would like to notice that in order to, uh, for these relations to become transparent and sincere, 
all countries should respect and support each other. We must avoid double standards and make every effort for diplomatic and peaceful resolution of the frozen conflicts, because any invasion, terrorism, occupation, or military conflict could create a dangerous risks for fulfillment of common energy policy and future political stability in OECD area. And also, I want to say and express my thanks to Finland delegation, because uh, they said about a uh, model of uh, Swedish-Finland uh, resolution of their conflict. Uh, our country proposed to Armenia and to Nagorno-Karabakh, to Nagorno-Karabakh, wide-range autonomy, but they refused to accept such autonomy, and the uh, Armenian side tried to express and connect their occupation of Azerbaijan lands uh, by wishness of people of Karabakh, Armenian people of Karabakh, to create new, establish a new second Armenian territory, and that's impossible. Thank you very much for such proposal. <coughs> Thank you for attention. Thank you. Uh, now, as I already announced, uh, Mr. Ronishenko, and followed by Maria Karapetian from Armenia. Достаточные участники нашего заседания. Я присоединяюсь к тем комплиментарным словам в адрес организаторов нашей сессии. И хотел бы на фоне этих оптимальных условий, которые нам созданы, проанализировать, как же мы с вами работаем, насколько эффективны наши решения, которые мы принимаем. Мы можем по этой 28-й сессии похвастаться решением по неонатологии, скорее всего, по окружающей среде, по миграции, несмотря на очень сложную проблему. Но есть у нас явные решения, которые не только не отражают ситуацию, но наоборот, наоборот ей вредят. Мы много говорили о милитаризации Закавказья. И действительно милитаризация идет. Но госпожа Кацарава не только подготовила слабый доклад, она сделала преступление против своего грузинского народа, не отметив самую главную проблему, которая представляется опасной для ее страны. Это наличие на, ее, на территории Грузии военно-биологической базы, которая сегодня представляет огромную опасность. Такая же работа ведется на Украине и в других наших постсоветских республиках. Что касается доклада по Украине, сделанным депутатом Хаджинян, он беспомощный по своему содержанию. Мало того, что мы не делаем ничего для того, чтобы проанализировать ситуацию с двух сторон, прячась за рогатками, мы не отражаем тех явных, видимых, знаемых всеми проблем. Мы с вами слушали арию любящего сына. Так вот я должен сказать, что этот любящий сын взорвал электропери... электролинию, которая питала Крым, перекрыл воду для Крыма, и вместе с его матерью страдает, страдали 2 миллиона людей. Вот эти вещи мы не можем замечать. Что касается второй стороны, то мы обязаны там побывать. Все условия есть, и вы увидите, как живут люди, и мы будем знать ту ситуацию, которая есть. А то, что мы встречаем 75-летие Великой Победы, не приняв никаких решений по неонацизму, и слушали здесь воспитательные речи, в том числе и со стороны Соединенных Штатов, которые бомбили Белград. Белград бомбили, не каких-то там этих. Они нас учили жить здесь. Это безобразие. И мы должны соответствовать той реалии, в которой мы живем. И главная ответственность перед нашими народами. Благодарю. Well, uh... Next speaker uh, is a Mr. Hassanov from Azerbaijan, followed by Mr. Berayev from Georgia. Sorry, I called al already Armenia. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, please. My Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Um, dear colleagues, I would like to start with uh, joining the words of appreciation extended to our hosts in Luxembourg and also uh, congratulating all of our elected officers and wishing them best of luck uh, in preparing reports and resolutions and facilitating our conversations. I want to acknowledge the work we have carried out in these past few days. Good job, everyone. I want to highlight the moments where we have had a genuine dialogue and constructive approaches. We need to analyze how we were able to achieve them and put forward efforts to reproduce and multiply these moments. 
Very often, these moments were possible because we were able to use a balanced language. And I want to stress that sometimes a balanced language does not mean a toothless or a weak language. In some cases, a balanced language means not promoting one-sided narratives and supporting peace. And we were able to support the recent positive dynamics in the peaceful resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and efforts of the OSC Minsk Group co-chairs. I also want to thank all of the colleagues here that in this final session have expressed this appreciation. In cases where a balanced language already exists, it's important for us not to try to break the equilibrium, but to direct our energies towards using more of the relevant mandates and formats of the OSC to resolve the outstanding issues. The Helsinki Final Act. Yes, we need to honor all of the principles of the Act. I'm glad we've been able to do this because the principles of the Decalogue are mutually reinforcing. I believe we have also acknowledged that conflicts are unique and we need to have a tailored approach to each. I'm glad that the Parliamentary Assembly acknowledged human rights, including the right to self-determination, or to paraphrase, the right of people to define themselves as a basis for the resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. I similarly believe we've acknowledged that moving forward, especially through sustainable development, has a component of dealing with the past. Genocide prevention can only happen through acknowledging the past. A final note on human rights and conflicts. It seems sometimes that politicians and institutions fear that doing justice to people's rights might somehow translate into a political status, especially if we come in contact with people. I do not see this as a risk. But even for those who do, not taking care of human rights is an outright damage rather than a risk. After all, conflicts often arise because of human rights violations and peace processes with unattended rights loom large in the eyes of those whose rights are violated or dismissed as a negation of their human and not national identity. I've said this in Vienna during the first OSCE event I was attending as a parliamentarian and I will repeat it again. It is only if we complement the conversation about the positions of sides with a conversation about the needs, fears, hopes, and concerns of people that we can hope to reach sustainable solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have a few more speakers and we'll conclude soon. Uh, as I announced, it's uh, Mr. Hasanov from Azerbaijan, followed by Artem Turo from Russia. Thank you very much, Mr. President, dear colleagues. Today, achieving security in OCC area should be a top priority for the Parliamentary Assembly, taking into account the current unstable nature of international relations. International organizations should contribute to creating the security across the OCC area. In this regard, issue of protracted conflicts across the OCC area has got a vital importance because without settling armed conflicts, there is no point in talking about sustainable development. Currently, protracted conflicts are the main obstacle that hinders the sustainable development of entire nation. The Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan is one of such conflict zones. The OCC means group has made unsuccessful efforts to resolve this conflict since the early 19th. Some of my colleagues in their speech mentioned about the conflicts between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And I, will, and I want to remind you that in the, first in the first half of the 90s, Armenia has seized Karabakh and the surrounded seven districts of Azerbaijan. More, 25, more than 25 years have passed, but the situation has not changed. Armenia refuses to withdraw its troops despite the peaceful stance of Azerbaijan and the initiative of the OCC means group. I would also like to remind you that the international community has repeatedly called on Armenia to withdraw its troops from the occupied lands of Azerbaijan. During the first half of the 19th, the UN Security Council adopted four resolutions calling for Armenia to withdraw its military. At the same time, the OCC top summit in Lisbon in 1996 supported Azerbaijan. With great regret, we have to state the absence of tools of international organization to achieve peace. Such circumstances lead to fresh conflict and lack of productive negotiation. 
despite long negotiations, we are remaining locked in stalemate. There is international law that all nations are obliged to respect. Unfortunately, some countries are trying to manipulate international law. Using the force and violence, they deny international rules. And to summarize my speech, I want to tell, as in peace, we should not tolerate a disrespect of international law, as it leads to violence. Let's show that the law and unity trump violence and division. This is the only way to achieve sustainable development and security in OCC area. And uh, in the end, I want to thank again uh, to OCC Parliamentary Assembly for its strong stance for the territory integrity, uh, sovereignty, and inviolability of internationally recognized border of Azerbaijan. Thank you very much for attention. Well, next speaker, Mr. Turov, followed by Mr. Beraya. Please, and I'd like to remind to you, dear colleagues, that just uh, uh, Gustavo and other staff members also told me that's a 25 minutes to the closure of uh, uh, election uh, process, so to the end of that. So you have 25 minutes, so didn't vote so far, please go and vote. Good uh, evening, colleagues. К сожалению, хочется констатировать, что в очередной раз стыдно за парламентариев ряда стран, которые своими безответственными политизированными решениями приводят к тому, что в Европе появляется поколение, не знающее правды о Второй мировой войне. Российская делегация внесла на рассмотрение сессии резолюцию о борьбе с ксенофобией, агрессивным национализмом и связанной с ними нетерпимостью. Наша инициатива в первую очередь была связана с набирающей обороты кампаний по переписыванию истории. Согласно проекту, мы выносили такие проблемы, как распространение теории превосходства по признаку расы, национальности, религии или культуры в регионе ОБСЕ, а также признание неонацизма опасным явлением, с которым должны бороться политики. Ассамблея должна была признать, призвать страны члены ОБСЕ активно противодействовать актам героизации любой форме нацистского движения, включая бывших членов организации ВАФНСС. К сожалению, ряд наших коллег из делегации Литвы и Украины в агрессивной форме раскритиковали наш проект, манипулируя фактами и вводя обсуждение от содержания резолюции. Потому что мы видим ссылки этих стран на коммунизм, попытку увести в сторону. Друзья, коммунизм в прошлом и ряд тех преступлений, которые были обсуждены у нас в стране, а героизация фашистов, нацистов, это действительно сегодняшняя. И в том числе именно в этих странах, в Литве и Украине, где наблюдается обеление преступников, пособников нацизму, и делают попытку сделать из военных преступников героев национально-освободительных движений. К большому сожалению, часть национальных делегаций не вникла в наше содержание и содержание предложений и голосовала против нашей идеи как таковой, пойдя на поводу у стран, демонстрирующих крайнюю степень русофобии. Уважаемые коллеги, мне кажется, стоит уйти от штампов блоковости и стереотипов холодной войны, и действовать по тем проблемам, которые волнуют и беспокоят все человечество, сообща. Спасибо. Well, uh, so we'll have uh, two last speakers, uh, Mr. Beraya from, from Georgia and Ms. Agaiva from Azerbaijan. And we will finish with, the, with this part of our agenda. Uh, thank you very I much, Mr. Sorry, the Vysotsky, Mr. Vysotsky also here. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I would like to respond to Russian propaganda and disinformation voiced by Mr. Onyshenko from the Russian delegation here. As you well know, Russian delegation has many times stated that NCDC Richard Luger Center is allegedly the military agency of the U.S. which carries out dangerous experiments, prepares biological weapon. Richard Luger Center in reality is a research center that is open institution under the auspices of the National Center for Disease Control and public health of Georgia. The center complies fully with the provisions and obligations of the Biological and Toxic Weapons Convention and completely meets international standards for biosafety and biosecurity. The main goal of the center is to protect Georgia as well as region from infectious diseases through early detection, epidemiological surveillance, 
and scientific research. In response to the groundless concerns of Russia, on 14 and 15 November in 2018, Georgia conducted a peer review exercise in the center. To demonstrate its transparency and openness, Georgia invited all states' parties to the Biological Weapons Convention for the peer review compliance exercise. The relevant Russian experts were invited to participate in this exercise. However, we received only denial for such a participation. The group of experts elaborated a comprehensive report which says that facility demonstrated significant transparency about its research and diagnostic activities, and the visiting team observed nothing that was out of accordance with prophylactic, protective, and other peaceful purposes. Time, again, time and again, I would like to stress that stands disinformation of propaganda of the Russian Federation and its efforts and attempts to use this floor for this is alarming and concerning. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now Mr. Uh, Vysotsky, he was uh, in this list, I didn't, didn't see him a minute ago, sorry. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Gaeva from Azerbaijan. And it's finished. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, on behalf of Ukrainian delegation, I would like to thank uh, Luxembourg for this outstanding venue, for this outstanding uh, days. Uh, and, well, my statement, I think it will be clear to uh, synchronize what Georgian said. You know, the Russian delegations uh, have uh, a really peculiar uh, eyesight. They see uh, uh, the shellings from orbit, they see the imaginary biological weapon centers in Ukraine and Georgia, but uh, strange enough, they don't see Russian troops at Crimea, Donbass, and other regions of instability, uh, and uh, they uh, speaking about this from year to year. You know, every, every and each year, we in uh, uh, this assembly uh, are calling Russia uh, to uh, withdraw the troops from Ukrainian territory, from Georgian territories, to deoccupy Crimea, uh, Donbass, and occupied territories of other countries. Each year we make declarations and nothing changes. Uh, we see that uh, in Europe uh, a strange trend is going, uh, uh, is going on. We see that some sanctions and some international organizations are being withdrawn from Russia. We see that some countries are saying about making business as usual. Uh, and uh, uh, while nothing changes, while Russian aggression to my country and other countries of the OC region continues, uh, uh, the world uh, uh, is starting to you know, make its way to make some you know, negotiations with Russia again. Uh, I know Russians for many years. I know Russian policies. I've studied in, in university. I wrote articles about this theme. And uh, what I want to say, uh, Russians are always destabilizing Europe, and they will continue to do this. Russians always see you as their enemies. Please uh, make a solidarity act uh, from with, with Ukraine and with your values. Please uh, understand that Russia will destabilize the world again. Thank you. Uh, well, and then our last speaker, Ms. Sagaiva from Azerbaijan, and the list is closed. Thank you, Mr. President, dear colleagues. I'd like to start by thanking our distinguished hosts for their hospitality and excellent organization of the session in such a beautiful city. It's good that we have such an opportunity for debating most pressing issues. I don't want to speak about what has been happening in the result of Armenia's military aggression against Azerbaijan. You all are well aware of the fact that 20% of our territory are under occupation. But now I can't help mentioning that in July 2014, two civilians, Tilgam Askarov and Shafaz Guliyev, were taken hostage while trying to visit their homeland in Kelbajar. The illegal court of the separatist regime in Nagorno-Karabakh sentenced Tilgam Askarov to, the, to life imprisonment and Shafaz Guliyev to 22 years imprisonment. The images of Dilgam Askarov and Shafaz Guliyev before and after their forcible capture clearly demonstrate that they were subjected to inhuman treatment physical and moral torture during their hostage. 
As a result of this, Dilgama Eskiyarov and Shafaz Guliyev now suffer from very serious disease. The Armenian side deliberately demonstrating through the media its inhuman treatment of them, thereby exert psychological pressure on members of their families and relatives. Those two persons, 25 years ago after occupation, had to flee their home as other IDPs, the village they had grown up. During Armenian's military aggression, many people lost their lives. Of course, among them were these two persons' relatives. So after 20 years experiencing such unhelpful emotions, the feeling to see the places of childhood, the feeling to visit the graves of their families defeated them and they decided to use the mountain pass just to visit the village, to visit the graves of their relatives. They are being subject to torture and it's already the fifth year that they continue to be legally deprived of their liberty, which is against the international humanitarian law. Contrary to the provision of the Geneva Convention of 1949 and the additional protocols thereto, which prohibit the hostage taking of civilians and require humane treatment of civilians during military conflicts, the Armenian side continues to fragrantly violate these commitments taken at the international level and doesn't consider the calls of the Azerbaijan side to respect humanitarian law and on a mutual basis immediately to release detained civilians from both sides. By such actions, the Republic of Armenia also continues to seriously violate some other conventions on human rights, as I have limited time, I can't count all of them here. So, dear friends, I'd like to reiterate our call on inter international community to pay due attention to the cases of the mentioned Azerbaijan civilians and take necess necessary steps with a view to ensuring their safe return to their families in light of their deteriorating health conditions. Thank you for attention. So with this, dear colleagues, we completed our general debate and we will follow now and then to move to another uh, chapters of our agenda. Once again, I'd like to remind you to all who didn't vote so far, 15 minutes, you have 15 minutes to go and vote, so please take it into consideration. And now, uh, in our Let's say next part of our agenda, there are reports uh, from the special representatives and from the election observation missions. I'd like to the first thank all the speakers who took part in the debate and, of course, all the speakers now who will, who will speak because of their very dedicated work. And as far as we have special requests of French head of delegation, she's living, so we a little bit replaced her... Uh, Report and I'd like now to ask uh, Ms. Sarin Morborn uh, to present report on North Macedonia's election observation. Please, the floor is yours, dear Sarin. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Dear colleagues, I was very pleased to be appointed as special coordinator for the important presidential election in North Macedonia, which required two rounds of voting in April and May. Thank you particularly to Reynold Lopatka from Austria, who headed the strong team of 40 members from the OSCEPA. We work closely with colleagues from the Council of Europe PA and ODIR, who did excellent work. Our overall conclusions was was that voters were able to make an informed choice between competing political visions with fundamental freedoms of assembly and expression respected in the campaign. Despite some technical challenges, the elections was overall well administrated. Our observers found that both elections were days were peaceful, orderly, and transparent and overall assessed positively. Serious legal and regulatory gaps were partially addressed through cross-party political agreements. These were short-term fixes, but there remain a real need to finalize a previously initiated reform of electoral legislation. We would be pleased to engage with our colleagues' parliaments in North Macedonia to support this process. I was also pleased to note that, especially in advance of the second round, the candidates and parties made efforts to particularly 
reach out the ethnic Albanian and Roma, among whom the turnout had been notably low in the first round. You have all received the full report of our mission, so I will not to go into further details. However, I will add one further comment that I think is relevant for all of our countries. We found that technical malfunction of the state election commission IT system raised question about IT security. This point to a larger problem in many of our countries, what we must pay attention to. We must all take seriously the investment in democratic processes if we really want sustainable democracy. We had an overall positive experience in North Macedonia and I hope that with this election cycle brought to a successful conclusion, the political leadership will undertake real reform and address the remaining challenges facing to the country. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, and thank you for being there also two times, two rounds, and, uh, and, and uh, conducting a very good job. Thank you. Please, North Macedonia. Thank you, President. Thank you, Madam Mobon, for your objective and well-balanced report for the presidential election. As you mentioned, presidential election in North Macedonia was well run and fundamental freedoms of assembly and expression were respected and the election day was peaceful, orderly and transparent. We are committed to implement all the recommendations in our future elections. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, now, now we will start uh, reports of our ad hoc committees and the first report on Committee on Counterterrorism. As you know, the chairman of this committee, Makis Voret, is not today with us because of elections in Greece. We wish him all the best and success in these elections. And I'd like to... Pardon? Okay, very good. Congratulations then to our member who was elected now in Greek Parliament. Congratulations. And now I call um, uh, on uh, Ms. Katsarava, Vice Chair of the OSCP Ad Hoc Committee on Counterterrorism, to present the work of the committee. Well, please. Dear President, dear Secretary General, dear colleagues, I'm delighted to address you today in my capacity as Vice Chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Countering Terrorism to present the fifth report on the work of the CCT. Before doing so, though, I would like to express my sincere condolences to Mr. Kovalev's family, friends and colleagues for their terrible loss on behalf of Chair Voridis and of all CCT members. Mr. Kovalev's tried to put the fight against terrorism high on our Assembly's agenda, paving the way for the creation of this committee, of which he had been a very knowledgeable and respected member. Since we last met in Vienna in February, the activities of the CCT have been mainly threefold. First, we exercised our policy-making power by putting forward a supplementary item mm -hmm. dealing with the priority issue of returning and relocating foreign terrorist fighters. Second, we continued building strategic partnership with relevant stakeholders to support and profile our Assembly's counter-terrorism efforts, notably by contributing to several international events where we shared our knowledge and engaged in cooperative dialogue. Finally, and only thanks to your support, we actively promoted the implementation of international counter-terrorist commitments by exercising our oversight power in the framework of the Parliamentary Assembly's initiative on strengthening border security and information sharing. The resolution on the challenges related to returning and relocating foreign fighters, terrorist fighters, puts forth a comprehensive policy framework to address a set of important challenges resulting from the return and relocating of foreign terrorist fighters, a major concern and top priority of the international community over the last few years. 
In this context, there is an urgent need for our participating states to set up effective mechanisms that enable prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration of foreign terrorist fighters and their accompanying family members, respectful of international human rights law. These policies and measures need to ensure national ownership to be implemented on a case-by-case -case basis and to address specific concerns, vulnerabilities, and needs of men, women, and children. Building on the UN Global Counter-Terrorist Strategy and UN Security Council Resolution 2178, and 2396, our resolution takes into account the innovative efforts of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly's ad hoc Committee on Countering Terrorism and follows up on relevant OSC commitments and OSC Parliamentary Assembly resolutions, including our 2018 resolution on preventing and countering terrorism and violent extremism and radicalization that lead to terrorism. As such, it lays out concrete measures on border control, criminal justice, information sharing, and counter-extremists, and urges participating states to enhance partnerships with OSC governments, governmental structures, and other key partners, particularly the UN and its agencies. In addition, the CCT continued to develop a strategic partnership with key international players in the fight against terrorism and violent extremism. Our chair, Mr. Voridis, addressed the yearly OSC-wide counter-terrorism conference, as well as violent extremism and radicalization that lead to terrorists in the OSC area in Bratislava. Mr. Voridis and Ms. Lisa Chambers actively contributed to the International Parliamentary Counter-Terrorist Conference, which brought together several parliamentary assemblies with the United Nations in St. Petersburg. Finally, a few days ago, Ms. Lisa Chambers briefed the Counter-Terrorist Committee on the Uni United Nations Security Council in New York, the most prestigious multilateral counter-terrorist forum in the world, on our contribution to counter-terrorism. These events have enabled us to profile our assembly and its efforts in fighting terrorism and violent extremism, as well as to build closer ties with the OSC executive structures, regional parliamentary fora, and UN structures that lead international counter-terrorism efforts. The event in New York, for instance, was the very first of its kind organized at the Security Council level, and it could lead to innovative partnerships where the potential of our assembly is fully leveraged. Soon, we expect to sign a dedicated memorandum with the United Nations to build a strong framework for this goal-oriented cooperation. Finally, following your diligent engagement and contribution, we analyzed national parliament's responses to the Parliamentary Assembly's initiative on strengthening border security and information sharing and compiled into a comprehensive report. This initiative built on the oversight power of our national parliaments to monitor and promote the effective implementation of international commitments contained in the UN Security Council Resolution 2396. With this ambitious initiative, we aim to bridge the gap between policy and practice by prevailing, uh, revealing promising practices and persisting challenges across the OSCE region. We consider this project as the Parliamentary Assembly's most tangible contribution to global counter-terrorist efforts to date. The initiative's final report was presented this week at the committee, and we will now prepare a fully-fledged OSC Parliamentary Assembly public publication to officially launch during, uh, to be officially launched during our upcoming autumn meeting in Marrakesh, which will be widely shared. On behalf of the CCT, I would like to thank you all for the enthusiastic support in this unique parliamentary exercise in the area of counterterrorism. And in conclusion, of course, I would like to thank uh, our President and our Secretary General for their support, which is instrumental in achieving everything I have described. And I would like to thank, take this opportunity to, th to thank Mr. Boridis, who is not here with us, as you all know, who tirelessly worked at developing and profile our assembly's counter-terrorist activities, and who unfortunately, as you know, uh, was unable to join us. And of course, huge thanks to the secretariat of this committee for their phenomenal support. And of course, I'm happy to um, further discuss uh, the issues related to this committee. Yes, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Katsarava. And thanks to really uh, to all the members of the committee for their very effective work. Chairman Vori, this, this committee brought, this ad hoc committee brought more visibility, I, I would say, and more effectiveness uh, to the, our assembly. And uh, we hope that we will continue in that way 
to fight with the terrorism, at least with the, with the instruments that we have <coughs> as a politicians. Uh, now, we have uh, one speaker, also member of this committee, Mr. Cosido. Muchas gracias, Presidente. Eh, antes que nada, querría en esta última intervención eh, agradecer en nombre de la delegación española a Luxemburgo la perfecta organización de, este, de esta asamblea. Eh, Luxemburgo es un pequeño país que aúna la capacidad de organización de los países del norte con la hospitalidad de los países del sur, y eso haya hecho que esta, esta asamblea haya sido perfecta. En relación con el trabajo del comité que tan brillantemente ha expuesto nuestra vicepresidenta, querría destacar que eh, la resolución en esta Asamblea fue aprobada con 70 votos a favor, ningún voto en contra y ninguna abstención. Y creo que ese consenso pleno, ese consenso total, es la mejor muestra, el, meso, el mejor mensaje que podemos dar en cuanto a la unidad y la cohesión de esta Asamblea en una materia tan importante como la lucha contra el terrorismo. Y, finalmente, presidente, me gustaría destacar que es importante en materia de lucha contra el terrorismo profundizar en la cooperación entre el Este y el Oeste en todos nuestros países miembros, pero también muy relevante profundizar en la cooperación del Norte y el Sur. La cooperación entre Marruecos y España es un modelo excepcional que quiero reconocer y agradecer en esta Asamblea, porque gracias a esa cooperación estamos teniendo éxitos tan importantes en la lucha contra el terrorismo. Y la próxima Asamblea que tenemos en Marrakech va a ser una buena oportunidad para ver cómo desde la OSCE podemos impulsar esta cooperación entre los países del norte y los países del sur en esta lucha común contra el terrorismo. Muchas gracias. Y enhorabuena al presidente del comité por su elección, por su magnífico trabajo, a todos mis compañeros de la comisión. Ese consenso en torno a la lucha contra el terrorismo es el mensaje más importante que hemos dado en esta Asamblea. Gracias. Thank you very much, dear Ignacio, also for your contributions uh, in the work of the committee. Now, uh, the next special representative will present the report. There will be distinguished uh, and honorable Heidi Fry, our special representative of gender issues. I also would like to tell you, dear colleagues, that there are, uh, there are several uh, special representative reports which already submitted in a written form. So some of our colleagues, they decided you know, to send and to circulate their uh, important findings. And now, and also one announcement before Haiti will start, uh, voting is over. So, office is closed, and when it will be time, there will be uh, announced results. The results will be announced. So, thank you. Now, dear Haiti, floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, President. I, I want to first start off by saying that um, my report is outside if you want to get it. It's, it's a very thick report, so I'm not going to go over it. I just wanted to pick some highlights. I wanted to say that as I came to this meeting this summer, I saw a huge change from when I first began to be here as a delegate and as gender representative. I have seen so many women coming as delegates. I have seen so many countries in the PA who have actually got women as head of delegations. So I think we have moved forward. But I also want to say that something that really has impressed me is to hear the OSCE and our own representatives at the table, the president and, and the, uh, the secretary general, talk about gender as if it is an essential part of what we do. And I just want to congratulate them on that. The penny has dropped. The, and so those are important things. But when I look around and I hear male members of this uh, parliamentary assembly speaking powerfully and with knowledge of the complex issues of gender, I know that we have made progress. And I wanted to congratulate all of you and all of the men who have stood up here and spoken with passion about gender. And so I just want to congratulate you on that. Then, now I'm going to drop my negative 
comment, and that is, therefore, I find it difficult to understand why we still cannot approve a supplementary um, gender plan 2000. I don't understand why that doesn't happen, because we're doing it as we speak here. It doesn't mean that we have come full circle. It means that we still have a lot to do, but I just wanted to say that. Now, gender is evolving. The concept of gender is moving along, and I think, you know, when we started, it was a blunt instrument. When any equality measures begin, you have a big blunt instrument in which you say, look at us, we are having problems. So that was a blunt instrument. But now that we've seen the problems and we've understood gender, we need to tunnel down now to look at the more complex components of gender. Because gender really is the reality of the lives of men and boys and the reality of the lives of women and girls. And as we tunnel down, we are learning not to stereotype anymore. Boys are not as rigid as the old concept of male masculinity. There are many young men that we find today who are caught in this concept of rigid masculinity that they don't like. And we find that therefore we're seeing young men not participating in ways that they used to. They have retreated and many of them are reacting with anger and depression. And we now know that in Europe, there is four times the rate of suicide amongst men and boys than there are in any group. And so I just wanted to say, so let's not always see men as strong and victorious. They are having problems and we need to look at that reality of their life. And girls, we tend to talk about girls and women as being victims, they are. Indeed, they are vulnerable to susceptible to rape and to, and to trafficking, etc. But women are also able to be powerful. And if we allow them to be empowered, we can see, as we heard many women at this uh, conference this time, speak with passion and with strength. So as we talk about gender, we want to talk about removing that stereotyping of girls as victims and look at how we can empower girls to participate and empower boys to participate and to show their caring side. Now, there is one thing as well in the complexity of gender, and it's intersectionality. It means that because we don't stereotype all men as being alike, and all women and girls as being alike, we need to understand that it is about the individual experiences of men and the individual experiences of women, and how that in fact their, impacts their ability to rise and to progress and to have equality. And so we need to therefore talk about things like racial status, things like indigenous status, the Roma. We need to talk about poverty, removing some women and, and men from the ability to move forward. We need to talk about the individuality of experiences. We will therefore no longer do a one size fits all solution, but we will have implementable solutions because we have understood the complexity and we will therefore be able to see outcomes. We'll see change and that change will move forward. And I want to talk about diversity a little bit. I think that it's important to understand the diversity of men and the diversity of women. Disability and all of those issues, youth, age, that are actually complexly affecting their ability to achieve equality of opportunity to be the best that they can be. And if we look at it, we will see that the challenges we face today are climate change, uh, migration problems. We now have 70.1 million people in this world who are actually displaced, who have no home, who have nowhere to live. And we see the generations of youth who are being lost because they cannot get education, they cannot work, they have no home. And this is a problem because when, we ha when they grow up, they have nothing to contribute. And then we will be able to find that we don't have people to contribute anymore, no one to take over the reins. And so that's really sad for me when we look at migrants as a problem. And again, we don't see the potential of migrants if we give them the opportunity to move forward. And I wonder why xenophobia and this inability to accept certain realities that are faced today, that we do not understand that this is the cause of what we see happening as our challenges. Are we afraid? Are we so afraid of change? Are we afraid of loss of power? I would like to, to, to talk about a man that I met and I was very in, impressed with and I became very much, he became a mentor to me and his name is Nelson Mandela. And when he became the president of South Africa and he had spent generations of blacks being actually oppressed by the white majority in South Africa. And I said to him, you came in here and you did not try to become the new oppressor. Why not? 
And he said, because all I would do is continue the cycle. I want to see us understand that South Africa is made up of whites and blacks and browns and yellow people. And all of us working together can make this a great nation. And that's the kind of thing we need to talk about. If we all work together, we forget our conflicts. We are not afraid of each other. We forget our differences and we understand that when we pull together, that we will actually make a difference. <clears throat> In my country, we have learned that inclusion leads to harmony. And I know lots of your countries have understood that too. But when you exclude people, you create conflict. Excluded people will always strive to be included, to be part of it. They want to be a part of what's happening. And so they will rise up and they will create revolution. We are seeing in today that all of the young people and others rising up against governments, speaking out against politicians, no longer trusting because they feel so excluded. And so I think in our country we have learned that inclusivity creates a sense of belonging and everybody begins to pull in the one direction, to try to move together to create common goals and com common objectives. And finally, I want to say that in Canada we love to say that diversity is our strength because we have seen it happen. And in nature, in biology, if you only plant one group of trees in the forest and they get attacked by a virus, they all die. If you have a multiplicity of trees in the forest, some will succeed and continue to thrive. So diversity is an important thing. And finally, I want to thank Luxembourg for this extraordinary uh, well-run convention and also some of the fun and the food that we've had in the evenings. That was really important. So I'm looking forward to seeing if in Vancouver we can provide that same level of hospitality to you. And I would like to close with a saying that has always been a very important one for me. If we start seeing each other as human beings, all of us together, everyone, regardless of our ethnicity, our race, our differences, if we start seeing each other as fellow human beings, we might be guided by the Reverend Niedermeyer, who after the Second World War said very clearly, when they came for the unions, I did not speak out because I was not a unionist. And when they came for the homosexuals, I did not speak out because I was not a homosexual. And when they came for the Jews, I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And when they came for me, there was no one left to speak for me. We're in this together, colleagues. Let's pull together and make the differences that we can make. I know we can do it. Thank you very much, dear Heidi. We have no, uh, you know, nobody as a, as a speaker on your report, but really thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, especially, but for the work that you are doing over the course of the years. It's not about, as you said, how many members we have. It, it of course, matters how many delegations are led by women, how many positions we have led by women, and we have quite a few. And uh, even here, I saw that so many chairs, uh, so many uh, special reps, so many heads of delegations on observation missions are women. And it's about the quality that we try to preserve and to promote in this assembly. And I guess we will do more. It's not about our assembly. We're working also broadly beyond this assembly to achieve gender equality. Thank you very much. And thank you for hosting Vancouver with your old Canadian delegation. So uh, now a next uh, special representative, Pascal Alizard from France, our special rep in Mediterranean Affairs. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Chers collègues, je voudrais une fois de plus saluer nos hôtes luxembourgeois pour leur accueil et pour leur engagement envers notre Assemblée. 2019 est une année spéciale pour le partenariat méditerranéen de l'OSCEPA. En premier lieu, puisque notre prochaine session se tiendra au Maroc, à Marrakech, début octobre, sur le thème de la promotion de la sécurité dans la région euro-méditerranée, le rôle de l'OSCE et de ses partenaires. Je tiens à souligner que c'est la première fois dans l'histoire de notre Assemblée que nos règles de procédure ont permis à un État partenaire d'accueillir notre session d'automne, et c'est la première fois que cette règle sera appliquée et ce moment historique pour notre Assemblée sera rendu possible aussi grâce à l'accueil qui nous est préparé par nos amis de la Chambre des conseillers du Maroc sous la direction du sénateur El Bakouri. Et je tiens à remercier vivement le Royaume du Maroc pour cette invitation. 
Je souhaite aussi encourager les membres de notre Assemblée parlementaire ainsi que les parlementaires des, des États partenaires à se rendre à Marrakech pour cet événement exceptionnel lors duquel j'aurai le privilège d'animer le Forum méditerranéen qui s'y tiendra le vendredi 4 octobre. Je souhaite également profiter de cette occasion pour vous faire part, Monsieur le Président, chers collègues, de l'invitation qui nous a été récemment transmise par le docteur Ali Abdel Hall, le président de la Chambre des représentants d'Égypte, pour me rendre au Parlement du Caire afin d'explorer et de renforcer les domaines de coopération de notre Assemblée avec l'Égypte. Et je suis confiant qu'une telle mission pourra avoir lieu avant la fin de l'année. Je voudrais vous confirmer aussi que les contacts sont pris avec nos nouveaux collègues israéliens. Sachez également que je suis préparé à me rendre en Albanie fin octobre pour participer à la conférence méditerranéenne annuelle de la partie gouvernementale de l'OSCE. La dimension méditerranéenne de l'OSCE est essentielle pour assurer la sécurité du continent européen et vous pouvez, mes chers collègues, monsieur le Président, compter sur mon engagement afin de maintenir notre Assemblée au cœur des enjeux de la, réunion, de la région méditerranéenne. Je voudrais aussi remercier le secrétariat de notre Assemblée, particulièrement le secrétaire général adjoint, Gustavo Payares et son équipe, pour leur soutien dans mes activités. Et pour terminer, permettez-moi de féliciter Roberto Montella pour sa réélection et, Monsieur le Président, de vous remercier pour la confiance que vous me témoignez dans le, le, la mission que vous m'aviez confiée. Et je voudrais vous dire très simplement qu'elle est réciproque. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, dear Pascal, for a really very active work. And uh, we see how we're extending our partnerships in Mediterranean. And I think Marrakech and Morocco meeting will be very, very good evident and clear example for this, but also other countries, as you mentioned. So continue in that direction. We need more partnerships. Thank you. Now, so uh, there are, as I already told you, several special representatives' reports, which are already <coughs> sent it, they sent it in written form. And uh, with this, we concluded special reps, representatives' uh, statements and presentations, and we'll now move uh, to the election observation activities. Uh, there are some election observer activities, observation maybe missions that we can also discuss in our next sessions, having in mind uh, that we are quite a short on time. Uh, but which, which one? To the myself. So uh, apparently ask, I asked my Norwegian colleague, uh, Karin Harriksen, to report on Moldova. Uh, but she is a teller, and, and they are counting now votes for important announcement, I think, uh, in a half an hour, approximately. Uh, so I was special representative for three last three elections. It's happened in that way, in Moldova, in uh, Ukraine, and in Kazakhstan. If I will start now my report to all of them, it will be really very difficult. That's why I'd like to say a few general things, but in next hour meetings, we can, in more details, in more details, uh, make the presentation. First of all, you all know results of all the elections, uh, our statements or, this, or these statements, the final versions are already published, not for Kazakhstan, but for others. But uh, I would like to say general things. Uh, for all those countries, elections were very, very important. From Moldova, we understand the political landscape there, and it's good that after elections they try to found to try to find uh, the common language between the parties, between the uh, political groups. They have now coalition; they are moving forward, and uh, we already, you know, recommended many things there. So we are also ready to cooperate with with them. Uh, when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, of course, it was very important elections, elected a new president, and uh, all our findings uh, were there. It was quite a fair and quite a high standard, let we say, as we say, elections there were very, very well organized and administered. 
And now, as we announced with uh, my good friend and colleague Doris, so she was a head of delegation from the OECPA, we said that it's up to political forces now. Ukraine is in very difficult situation. We know and we heard debates around this, around tables and the committees here in this hall. Uh, that's very difficult to conduct democratic elections and also to deal with the conflict. And uh, we were quite happy that we saw that despite of that, Ukrainians managed to do that. And it's a very forward-looking project and we'd like to see, you know, more reforms and more, uh, of course, first of all, peace. And uh, we also commended uh, authorities and new president for good statements as we were there. When it comes to Kazakhstan, I think we'll, in more details, as far as uh, it's not ready, the final report is was, it was quite fresh. But for Kazakhstan, of course, it was historical moment. We had a critical views, but we had views also with full of recommendations, uh, with some novelties also. There were seven candidates and a female candidate first time, but most important thing uh, with the criticism, and with the, also with the wish to work together for future. Uh, we are thankful to our Kazakh colleagues. They, they stated today they are, gonna, they are ready to cooperate with ODIR, to cooperate with OSCPA, how to improve legislation, how to improve those shortcomings that we saw in Kazakhstan. And this is a main idea of this assembly. We are not going let's say, to punish somebody with elections, but we, were, we will be always very critical to the issues that we see when principles, where principles should be preserved and the old standard should be also um, kept. And that's the that's, uh, main idea when we are talking uh, in cooperation with, with our colleagues from different institutions. So at the end of my, this may be a general report, not to going into details, I'd like to uh, thank all of the colleagues who took part in, uh, in this endeavor and those elections, uh, delegation heads and also our partners from ODIR, from Council of Europe, from NATO Parliamentary Assembly, where they've been, and all the staff, our staff, uh, without them we couldn't do anything. And that effective work and a credibility and a leadership of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly and OSC in election observation activities all over the world, I think it's guaranteed by our stopping by your dear colleagues. So thank you very much. I will stop now here. And uh, if there will be any questions, maybe we can uh, in next hour meetings in more details discuss all the election observation missions. So thanks. That was my information about all those elections. Now, now we are moving to the very important part of uh, our work. All, this, all those debates, all those discussions, very tough, positive, whether the negativity, challenges we'll discuss here, we have to put now in our final declaration, which will be, I think, a milestone in, a, in our, uh, for our, uh, let's say, uh, future work. And it's, uh, it will be a Luxembourg declaration. So, according, according our rules, We'll now consider the draft Luxembourg Declaration, uh, which consists of the final resolutions from each of the three general committees together with the supplementary items, uh, referred to the general committee and plenary, which were considered by the drafting committee yesterday. I'd like to thank Lord Peter Bonus for chairing this committee and all the members who took part. Under paragraph two of uh, Rule 39 of our Rules of Procedure, no further amendments, no further amendments can be proposed at this stage. First of all, we vote on the resolutions passed by each of the three general committees, and it was also a request for few delegations, but, and then we will uh, proceed according to this uh, princip principle, and uh, now, uh, then we will uh, take uh, the supplementary items that were sent to the committees. In accordance with paragraph three of rule 39, the drafting committee met and produced this draft declaration and draft the resolutions of the assembly, as well as the preamble. 
And as already announced, Lord Bonn is chair of the drafting committee. There are some minor technical changes, dear colleagues, in the text before, uh, and you, but uh, there are no changes on substance uh, in anything the drafting committee has done on our behalf yesterday. We'll now consider the draft declaration. If there is an objection to a paragraph, only the following speak. I'm just explaining rules. Only following may speak. One speaker against the paragraph, one speaker in favor. The rapporteur or chairman. So, can we start the process? So, uh, we will now take the preamble and paragraphs from 1 to 35 of the draft declaration. Does anyone want a separate vote of any of these paragraphs? No, not the case. It's a doc. Okay. Please be, you know, Господин more careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a, just a second. Just a second. I'll give you floor, but just to ask everybody, I'm announcing. Please be more, you know, the the, the rapid in, in reaction. Please, the uh, floor is yours, uh, Mr. Rejak. Please. Господин председатель, прошу поставить на раздельное голосование резолюции общих комитетов. No, as I announced, we're discussing committee resolution separately. But if you like to or have any other, you know, objection or idea according to a specific paragraph, please, floor is yours, but do it, you know, now. Мы просим поставить на раздельное голосование общих резолюций, общих комитетов, не конкретно по пунктам. Резолюции общих комитетов. Я четко выразился. Мистер Рыжак, мы делаем эту работу много лет, и это очень, я думаю, очень ясная вещь. Я объявил не каждый параграф, но 1 до 35. Я не думаю, что это не какая-то конспирация. Пожалуйста, следуйте процедуру, и вы увидите, если у вас есть что-то против этого, пожалуйста, вы можете это сделать. Вы хотите что-то, Маргарет? Пожалуйста. La Suisse demande le vote séparé sur le paragraphe 24 de la première résolution. Merci. Thank you very much. This is according our rules. We will do accordingly. So, now, there will be separate vote on paragraph 24, as it was offered. Uh, by, by Margaret Kennan Nellen. First, does the assembly agree to all the paragraphs in the text up to this, of the dead point? So we have to agree on paragraphs up to 24 because it was announced up to 35. Now we have separately the 24. So no disagreements, then it's passed. Now paragraph 24, am I right? Okay. Now we come to paragraph 24. Uh, one minute to oppose this paragraph. Is there anybody opposing the paragraph 24? Please, Margaret, the floor is yours. Mr. President, of course, we all want ceasefire, especially Switzerland. But in this wording of the paragraph, unfortunately, in the first committee, an amendment by Switzerland and the parallel amendment of France were turned down, which would have rendered this paragraph um, comprehensive and objective. The Swiss amendment uh, asked for uh, deleting the last 
part of this paragraph, uh, which reads, in particular, the obligations under the Minsk agreements, which have not been fulfilled by the Russian Federation, and of the objective facts are that all sites to the Minsk agreements have not commit not uh, fulfilled obligations of the Minsk agreements. And that's the point Switzerland wants to hold here. This is not a just formulation of that paragraph because by a, by a vote in the first committee, this formulation passed, but the last point of that paragraph does not correspond to the facts because Understood. all sites violate Minsk agreements, to which they have committed repeatedly all sites. Well, uh, please, for all speakers, please stick with the one minute. Uh, now, uh, Ukraine, please, and no more speakers. Thank you. Uh, well, Ukraine delegation considered that uh, it's some kind of manipulation for five years. We always considered the supplementary items uh, and we reported you as uh, Ukraine uh, uh, following means agreements in uh, uh, from our one side, from our side we always tried to establish a ceasefire and uh, uh, the last, lay, uh, last ceasefire two days ago was corrupted by uh, the Russian side because after the ceasefire our two medicals uh, in the medical vehicle was killed at the front line. We tried, to, we even passed uh, 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 the law on the special uh, regions of Donbass uh, according to Minsk agreement. So we've done everything, but we have no ceasefire, we have no uh, hostages release, and uh, uh, if you will move aside this uh, 24 paragraph, uh, you will forget in the resolution about the occupation and annexation of Crimea, about all the violations, so I think uh, you know, it will be a very bad signal for the OEC Parliamentary Assembly. Please uh, leave uh, and leave this paragraph thank you very much thank, thank you very much and now only person who could speak from the hall uh, it's uh, rapporteur alan farrell if he wants to speak please yes thank you chairman um chairman my view on this is that this matter has been decided upon by the committee an amendment was, was tabled the amendment was defeated and i see no reason to change it at this point thank you Thank you very much. I think it's all clear. Now we have to vote. We are voting separately to the paragraph 24 that was suggested to amend it. Oh, I'm sorry, delete it, not amend it. Margareta offered to delete it. Please. Now, who is in favor to delete paragraph 24? Who is against to the, the, this paragraph 24? And please, abstentions. Thank you, colleagues. Eight abstentions. Oh, five abstentions. I don't think it's. Uh, I will now not, please. Abstentions. Please, I will announce it. Please. 
So, uh, 29 in favor of deletion, 79 against deletion, and 19 for abstentions. And it means that paragraph will stay. Thank you. Now, Point of order. Господин председатель, я правильно понял, что в зале присутствует 127 членов ассамблеи в соответствии с пунктом 1? Да, я правильно понял, что 127 членов ассамблеи присутствуют в зале? I'm very sorry, Mr. Rizak, I'm not counting members of assembly here, but I'm getting information from the people who are around, and I rely on their information. There were three figures, who is for, for who is against, who abstained. Then you can maybe put them together, and, and but, uh, but there could be people who left this uh, hall or came in. I can't tell you how many members are at this moment now. I already announced it. Thank you. Well, so uh, previously, if you remember, dear colleagues, we announced uh, from 1st to 35, it was only one objection to paragraph 24. So can we consider that? Господин председатель, но вы же понимаете, что в соответствии с пунктом 1. I will finish my word. Thank you. Thank you. I will finish my word. I'm, I'm, t I'm speaking. Please, not to interrupt me. I'm very polite with you. I'm very decent with you. Please, just a second. I'm explaining something and I'll give you to say. From 1 to 35. Point of order. No. At Вы же знаете, no, что в соответствии с пунктом no, первым параграфа 4 резолюции. Just a second. Mr. Rizak, I'd like to ask you, please. You know very well, very well rules of this committee. You know me also. I'm always accommodating to any of members Requests, please, I will say something to assembly and I'll give you something also to say from your microphone. Just a second. We announced from 1st to 35 there was only one objection to paragraph 24. Can we consider that up to 35 it's all agreed if there's no other objections? You have anything to the up to paragraph 35? If you don't have anything, oh, paragraph 35, that's it's proved. Thank you very much. Now, please, if you want to say something, point of order is here. Я хотел бы подчеркнуть, с огромным уважением я тоже к вам отношусь, но в соответствии с пунктом первым, параграфа 34, правила процедуры решения ассамблеи могут быть приняты только при присутствии большинства членов ассамблеи. Мы видим, что этого большинства очевидно нет в зале. Just, just a second, I will clarify it with our staff. Просто в зале нет кворума. Уточняйте. Можно переголосовать, но это надо уточнить. Отключаться. Okay, well, uh, I don't think that uh, that will be a right thing. Uh, I think a Russian delegation could be very well prepared even to screen everything, to see what's happening uh, from the up or down, and you could have all the information that what I have from my colleagues here, and I trust them. So it's a sufficient number of our delegates. Look, the hall is almost full. And I don't know why you are arguing against this. Please, don't make, not make not necessary barriers. It looks quite uh, ridiculous. So sorry. Now, dear colleagues, we could not pay attention only to your delegation. We have 56 others. 
Please, uh, dear colleagues, let's continue. Uh, otherwise, we don't have time. And Point of order. We, we see that it's clear, clear. Point of order. That's a clear attempt to disrupt the process. Sorry for this. Мы с вами не согласны. Вы, конечно, доверяете залу, но мы должны доверять и официальной информации. Я okay. прошу все-таки okay. получить официальную информацию. You will, you will get official statistics from our secretariat, but now we have the process, we have to finish it. And now, Mr. Rizak, Rule 34... У нас нет кворума, и решения не могут быть приняты. Они могут быть только теперь нелегитимными в дальнейшем. We have quorum. What do you want to say that we are now only using that? Does any other delegation is arguing against this? Why you are arguing against this? What happened? You you are better, you know, to count the members. I'm very sorry. So, Rule 34. I anticipated that, by the way. Rule 34. Provision second. Ну вы же сами сказали, что 127 человек присутствуют в зале. Вы же согласились со мной. Поэтому почему же мы кворума нет в зале? А раз кворума нет, мы нарушаем правила процедур грубейшим образом. Dear Mr. Rijak, how many years you are in the parliament? How many years you are in the parliament? Just to ask you, are you speaking with your chair in a Russian Duma or some federation in in the same time with your speaker there? Did they allow you there to do that, or they will allow you to do that? Please, I'll give you floor, but let me to finish. And I know that you are not happy, but here are figures. It's a big stuff, and the secretariat will provide. But, but the, the chair. Sorry, the, the sorry, sorry. Please, the chair shall determine the presence of the quorum. The chair председатель определяет quorum по нашим вот этим на основании я по-русски вам говорю на основании те, той информации, которую он получает. Я получил информацию, что здесь есть quorum. И я как председатель я говорю, что здесь есть quorum. Пожалуйста, не прерывайте, не показывайте себя с такой стороны. Плохо это, извините. Sorry, dear colleagues. Sorry. Well, we will continue and not ask me again the point of order at any time. When you see my microphone switched off, then you can ask for the word. I'm sorry for this. Now, I'm very sorry, dear, dear colleagues, but I, I really maybe I'm a little bit emotional, but I see that it's, it's always that, you know. We are here for dialogue, we are here for reconciliation, and we'd like to prove this resolution here together, and I'm, I will never tolerate when it's a specifically people are working to disrupt this process. So, and it was, by the way, in Berlin too, if you remember. So, uh, now, draft declaration, second committee, we will now take paragraphs from 36 to 81, of the draft declaration. I repeat, 36 to 81 of the draft declaration. Does anyone want to separate vote on any of these paragraphs? No. Then, draft declaration of third committee we will now take paragraph 82 to 188. So it's a many paragraphs here. We see, I give you time just to think a little bit. 82 to 188. Third committee, paragraphs to the draft declaration. Does anyone want separate vote on any of these paragraphs? Not the case. Thank you very much. Now, paragraphs 82, 188 agreed. We now come to consider the supplementary items from the three general committees. In the plenary, we have already agreed the supplementary items on the role of civil society, 
individuals and non-governmental organization and realizing the aims and aspirations of the OSCE on the role of national parliaments in preventing and combating corruption in the OSCE area and on effective migration governance based on promoting inclusive societies and dignified returns. So those are those were agreed. So we'll now vote and move straight to the next supplementary item. This one is a militarization by Russian Federation of Territory temporarily occupied the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, Ukraine, the Black Sea, and the Sea of Azov. There's assembly, uh, is the assembly content to consider resolution as a whole? Yes. So, now we will take the resolution as a whole. Any objections to the resolution? Point of please, order. Please, Mr. Rejak, floor is yours. That's okay now. Господин Сиретели, мы, конечно, вам доверяем и учитываем ваш большой опыт в работе парламента, но все же мы просим еще раз обеспечить кворум и просим пересчитать наличие кворума, обеспечить кворум. Вот наша единственная просьба. Большинство членов ассамблеи должно присутствовать в зале, а большинства нет. Покажите пример истинного парламентаризма, а на личности не надо переходить. I, I think we, this is a very clear what we are doing here together, maybe not you at this moment, but even you asking in this, in this tone and, and, and then this, this approach is acceptable. But again, we have information, we will check it again, and Secretary will come back with, with, with the answer. But now, if you have anything in substance of this, of this paragraph, but to say now that we don't have forum, and we will not, we are not eligible to vote on everything. What you'd like to say, we're not eligible to vote for the resolution. What are people three or four days here discussing all the time, and now you'd like with one question to finish with this. <laughs> I don't think that it's a right approach. I'm very sorry, please. Uh, then, no objections. It was not anything on substance. It was on procedural issue, which I responded. Uh, do you have anything of substance? Nobody? Then it's a no voting. Yeah. Resolution passed. Thank you. <laughs> then, where's another one? Now, another one. The challenges related to returning and relocating foreign terrorist fighters. Uh, can we? vote or consider this as a whole? Thank you. If someone wants, if someone wants to take floor uh, against this resolution, uh, objection to the resolution? Not the case, it's approved. Then, security and human rights situation in Abkhazia, Georgia, and the Sikhin Valley region of South Ossetia, Georgia. Assembly considered this resolution as a whole. Thank you. No objection. No, no, no. Now we'll ask, yeah. But so we can, if, if it's anything, you know, we can object to this, to this resolution. No objection. Thank you very much. This resolution approved. Thank you. Thank you, dear colleagues. Now, energy security in the OSC area. Can we consider it as a whole, as a one document, or there are some, some challenges to the paragraphs or questions? No. So, resolution taken as a whole. Мы категорически против, господин Церетер. Okay. Please. Please. Floor is yours. Мы категорически против резолюции и просим еще раз вернуться к процедуре голосования. Форум не кворум не обеспечен. Okay, energy security in the OSC area. You you are talking about this resolution, energy security in the OSC area, Mr. Rizak. Да, мы тоже категорически против этой резолюции, потому что носит политизированный характер. Okay, then it will be voting on this resolution. 
Does anybody want to speak for this resolution? Okay, then we can, we can. Yeah, and also I'd like to ask rapporteur or chair who is in the hall at this moment, if anybody wants to speak, a second committee. Rapporteur or chair? Chair is here. Ms. Katsarava, please, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we had lengthy discussions about this resolution uh, at the first committee uh, where it was adopted. Uh, we defended this resolution uh, this morning as well. Uh, it was voted by the majority uh, of those who are present here in this hall. Uh, we, of course, you, you, you know the content of the resolution. Uh, I'm not going to repeat it again, uh, and I'm calling everybody uh, to support the resolution uh, and remind all of you that this is not for the first time that we and this assembly has adopted a resolution of this kind. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Katsarava. So everything is clear. Now we'll go for votes for this resolution, please. Who is supporting this? Who is in favor of this resolution? Please raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Sorry. Who is against? Okay. And abstentions? Okay. So abstentions are... So, for this resolution on energy security in the OSC area, we have uh, 94, 90, 90, one against, nine abstentions. Resolution is adopted. Point of order. господин председатель, ну мы еще раз убедились, что в зале отсутствует кворум. Ну это же очевидно. 104 человека. Это очевидно, но мы же сами выглядим не очень прилично. И вы должны помочь Mr. нам вырулить Richard. из этой ситуации. Мистер Рижар, look, it's not the case that all the members who are sitting here, they should vote or should be in the hall. Why you are calculating only, for, for instance, next vote will be 42, 4, one abstention and three against. What does it mean? We don't have quorum for this? It's a miscalculation, please. That's a people who are, people can vote or not vote. It's there right here. Why you are calculating by these figures? So, please, Mr. Rijak, with, with all respect I can, can collect now in myself and try to accommodate to you, please stop to disrupt this process. Once again, please stop this. I understand that you have to report somewhere back that you did a good job here, but really try to be constructive. Try to be constructive. Господин Церетели, позвольте мне сказать, видимо, последний раз. В правилах Ассамблеи четко сказано, что должно проголосовать большинство членов Ассамблеи. Большинство. Okay. Совершенно четко сформулировано. Если вы придерживаетесь okay. иной позиции, нам Dear, не остается ничего другого, как покинуть зал. Dear Mr. Rizak, I was I was wondering when you will announce that you are leaving the, this uh, hall because you did the same in Berlin, because you are always I'm very sorry for this trying to find some reason to leave the hall. Stay here, listen to this. I think we'll have 
altogether better results. It's not good. So uh, again, dear colleagues, I don't want to be you know, misunderstood. All the questions will be addressed. In Berlin, there were questions from Russian delegation. It was a similar procedure. It was addressed. We followed that. When we saw that, that we need to even change some rules, we did it. Now, we are doing this process. We are conducting. I'm chair. We are here with secretariat that you are here. Only one delegation, one member, is asking those questions. It will be responded by secretariat, and we will try to prove together who is right. Now, please, let us to work. Again, we have few <laughs> resolutions here. Agree? I think we agree on this. Good practice for states related to private military and security companies. Can we consider it as a whole? Thank you. Is there any objections to the paragraphs or to the resolution? No. It's adopted. Thank you. Another one is strategic foresight in science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development. And again, I'm asking you, dear colleagues, can we consider as a whole document? Thank you. And any objections to the resolution? No, it's passed. It's a uh, okay, please. Please. Господин Церетели, ну вам же не трудно обеспечить подсчет присутствующим по поднятым карточкам. Это же очевидно, можно сделать, пойти на встречу нашей делегации. Мы больше ведь ничего не требуем. Okay, I think some, some colleagues already started. Uh, they, 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 they want to speak from the restaurant because we can't continue in this, uh, in this spirit. Please, Peter, if you have any, any suggestion. that they are at least nine members and you are one you should look at the discipline of your team to be present and you are the last one who can now say about quorum because your delegation is undermining the quorum with a big amount slovak delegation is 100 percent present you should think about your delegation and call them back well i will not continue thank you very much but I will not continue this discussion because uh, the chair has its responsibility. It has its mandate everywhere, in every parliament, it's also here. I'm not hostage of uh, different uh, games here. Uh, strategic foresight and science, technology, and innovation, we adopted it. No, no, no we didn't. Okay. okay, so any objections to the resolution as a whole? No objections. Thank you. Adopted. Well, it's, it's a lot of them. I mean. So integration of gender and youth perspectives in efforts to combat climate change. As a whole, anybody's objecting? No. Adopted. It's a good work of the committees. Thank you very much. Digitalization as an advantage for gender policies. Anybody's against? To, to consider it as a whole? No. Objections to the resolution? No. Adopted. Promoting energy security by ensuring access to sustainable energy. As a whole? Agree? Any objections? No objections. Decided. Adopted. Thank you. Educating school children to avoid human trafficking. Again, my question is uh, we can consider it as a whole. No paragraphs were challenged. Nobody is against this resolution. Adopted. Now, neonatal care as a social development target. Can we consider it as a whole? Okay, anybody's against? No, adopted. I call for stronger 
a call. I also call for a stronger OSCE. <laughs> a call for stronger OSCE action to take account of increased discrimination against Christians and followers of other minority faiths in certain OSCE participating states. Can we consider this all this resolution? Thank you. Anybody is against this resolution? Adopted. And now, now is the exciting moment, dear colleagues. Uh, we will finally vote for the comprehensive entire Luxembourg Declaration. And I'd like to ask you to consider it as a whole, as a document, entire document. Thank you. Is there anybody against? If everybody is agreed, then Luxembourg Declaration is adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very sorry, but I'll give floor to the Turkish delegation. Uh, I did not see them. Uh, they, they raised the, uh, their tag, so please. But it's already. We, we, ob uh, we, the Turkish delegation objects this uh, resolution 98 uh, because it's against the Astana Declaration's rules. And also, we are against uh, Article 142 because here uh, there are some uh, unfair uh, evaluation about the state in Turkey and state of emergency was removed last year, one year ago. So we are against this uh, 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 proposal. Um, yes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, I agree with you that that says security measures. It's, it's not the, re the reason to maybe mention now because it was lifted, uh, I think, a year ago. But all those paragraphs which you mentioned now, we already passed a few minutes ago before we adopted other supplementary items. So I guess it was time before to speak for this. Mm. I think it's now late. Okay. Once again, I think uh, I have to repeat, maybe we already adopted, but once again, before we go once again, uh, again, our colleague, but that will be last intervention I will let you to speak on this point. Please. Благодарю, что господин председатель дал возможность сделать там последнее выступление, учитывая, что данная резолюция принята в присутствии третьей членов ассамблеи, мы ее не признаем и не будем считать обязывающим документом для исполнения. Благодарю за внимание и всех за плодотворную работу. Thank you, sir, for your sincere answer. It's, it's, of course. Your decision. You can recognize this resolution or not. You are recognizing some countries which are not recognized. Resolution is, I think, more simple one. So, let's say, dear friends, dear colleagues, let's finish this work once again. I'd like to ask you, Luxembourg delegation, as a uh, Luxembourg delegation is here. Luxembourg resolution as an entire document. Anybody is against it? No. It's adopted. No, no, it, okay, you, we will count it, we will count it. One. Okay, there will be vote, there will be vote. Okay, who is in favor of, favor of Luxembourg Declaration? Please raise your hands. Thank you. Against? No, 
six here and a seven here. And abstentions? Okay. What do we have? <coughs> so 94 in favor, 7 against, 11 abstentions. Luxembourg resolution is adopted. Congratulations. Well, uh, my dear friends and colleagues, now uh, we have some important also parts of our agenda to, to be fulfilled. Uh, and I'd like to ask you, ask our treasurer, uh, the Doris Burnett, to take floor and to report as a treasurer of our assembly. Please, dear Doris, floor is Thank you, Mr. President. In my last minutes as treasurer of the OECE EPA Parliamentary Assembly, I would like to start my report by warmly thanking the Chamber of Deputies of Luxembourg for the outstanding support provided to our organization and hosting uh, this annual session. I know how much money that means. My gratitude also to all of those member parliaments that have hosted and will host assembly meetings in the end events. My full report has been distributed to all of you, so I, let me be brief. I'm pleased to report the, uh, to the assembly that the finances of the OSCE parliamentary assembly continue to be in very good order. I'm very grateful to the Standing Committee for the unanimously approving my proposal for the assembly's budget. Uh, for the next final uh, financial year. This new budget has been thoroughly prepared together with the Secretary General and his team in order to reflect the growing needs of the Assembly. The Standing Committee agreed that the increasing needs of the Assembly requires financial backup. The agreement to adjust the budget will an in, uh, with an increase of uh, 186,499. Uh, euros compared to this year's budget is very much appreciated. I have ensured that our budget continues to comply with and reflects the efforts of our national legisla legislators to minimize expenses and remain within our objectives of austerity and accountability to use our taxpayers' money. Our full institutional, budgetary, and administrative autonomy and full independence from the OECE structures makes us a flexible, efficient, reliable, and respons uh, responsive institution distance from the budgetary problems faced yearly by the OECE governmental side. However, the scales are, um, they are also for us, and we, ca we cannot m mangle with those scales. Therefore, no reduction can be possible. This being my last report uh, to you as treasurer, I wish to thank you all of the national delegations for your support. This is important, it's important that the national delegations contribute to supply the assembly. This can be done by seconding personnel like Ital Italy and Germany does, or hosting assembly meetings and events, just like Luxembourg did this year and next year Canada or extra um, uh, budgetary contributions. I take this opportunity to thank once again the Parliament of Denmark, our biggest and most generous contributor for this its significant financial support in providing for our office in Copenhagen as well as for hosting our bureau um, every spring. I welcome that my successor will be Peter Jensen from Denmark, who knows our organization very well, and it's just a staircase down um, from, uh, for him to the finance officer of our secretariat. The secretariat of our assembly is deeply rooted in Denmark. 
in its democratic working mentality and its effic efficiency and independence. I'm also very grateful to the Austrian government, which provides assistance for our li liaison office in Vienna. Mr. President, let me conclude by report, um, my report by warmly congratulating and thanking our Secretary General Roberto Montella and his financial team, Gustavo Palares, Marietta Samac, and Stephen Paul, for their continuous efforts and proven results in making this institution so efficient in such a transparent, accountable, and most um, and cost-effective way while maintaining its full independence. It has been a real honor and a real pleasure for me to serve you as your treasurer during these past years. Thank you all very much. Theodoris, uh, what I'd like to tell you as a, my good colleague and friend for many years, and also you're serving here as a treasurer. We've been always very much satisfied with the work you've done, of course, with the Secretariat in cooperation, very close cooperation. And uh, we did not have any failure in our budgets. We were very good on that. Of course, it's not a big budget. We always had this desire to increase it, but uh, we have uh, maybe certain difficulties and it's uh, uh, and it's uh, it's I think uh, quite quite obvious that we need more money for more activities, but which we have, it was always spent wisely. Our treasurer ensured all the transparency and all the let's say important professional work which should be carried out. So because she's really professional in that, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of all our assembly for your great work, and I think and I'm sure that you will help us, you know, and, and uh, help uh, maybe new treasurer who will be elected, uh, and it will be announced, I think, very soon. So I think so. Uh, uh, it's, important project, it's important work that was done uh, by Doris Burnett, and uh, we congratulate her with this work. Thank you. Now, also very important part of our uh, agenda, report of Secretary General, who was uh, re-elected by you a few days ago, and congratulations, Roberto, again. Thank you, Mr. President, dear members. We are getting late in the day, but uh, I'll try to be short, but some things have to be said here. So uh, we chose a very ambitious uh, theme for this annual session. Uh, the sustainable uh, development goals of the UN and how they are interlinked to security. I think this was a, a very uh, risky and ambitious uh, exercise uh, and the risk of uh, making very ambitious goals is that sometimes you do not live up to your ambitions. But uh, I think the declaration that we've just approved is uh, a living document that uh, uh, testifies to the fact that we've actually lived to that ambitions. You have elaborated on issues of uh, uh, terrorism, migration, uh, uh, human trafficking, uh, energy security. I think you have uh, provided uh, uh, good uh, thought, uh, food for thoughts for the ministers who are meeting this afternoon and uh, tomorrow in Slovakia. Uh, myself, uh, with the president uh, of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, whoever he or she will be, we will find out uh, in uh, the next uh, point uh, item on the agenda, will now, in half an hour, fly to Slovakia to meet the uh, foreign ministers of the OSC and to also present the work of uh, this assembly. Uh, I have an appeal to the members. Uh, um, I know that uh, back at home, uh, you are always constrained by the electoral cycle. You are constrained by, of course, uh, the popularity that you need to have in order to be re-elected next time. So uh, sometimes we are constrained by the electoral cycle. Nowadays, with new technologies, we are constrained by uh, the next tweet or the next poll. So sometimes uh, when we uh, elaborate policies, we think on how will that impact uh, in uh, my constituency and whether it will give me the chance to be re-elected tomorrow. But in this assembly, 
we do not have that uh, strength. I think, of course, in this assembly, you come with your own domestic agendas, and you try to, um, of course, bring up issues that will give you some visibility back at home. But I would really like to appeal to members uh, to look at the challenges we have in front of us. We have the challenges of the movement of people, the challenges of fighting uh, terrorism, the challenges of climate change. We were in Norway. We have really seen uh, what that means. Uh, these challenges, preventing conflict, uh, conflict resolutions, uh, require a long-term perspective, require policies and analyses that have a long-term perspective. And so you can do this here. I think you can do both. You can look at the domestic agenda and bring forward ideas that will give you also the visibility that you deserve back at home, but also try to use this assembly now and in the future also to bring this more uh, wider perspective in our elaborations. Uh, the minister of, uh, uh, the prime minister of Luxembourg made a fantastic and I think very emotional speech when he spoke at the opening of this plenary session. He talked about the issue of inclusion. I think this is uh, uh, an issue that in this parliamentary assembly we know very well. This is what we do here. We include everybody. You've seen today is, of course, we have big disagreements, but everybody is in the room. We express our disagreement, but we include everybody. So I appreciate uh, the uh, work that you've done in these uh, days. I congratulate you on this. Of course, uh, I appreciate uh, that uh, the Standing Committee and the Bureau before in April renewed my mandate. I think it's a, a nice testimony for the work that we do as the International Secretariat. So I'd like to also thank all my colleagues in the International Secretariat, those who are here, those who are behind the scenes who have organized this assembly and have made a huge effort. Now, uh, I would like to um, ask uh, and plead to you to leave your mobile phones, leave your pens, uh, free your hands, uh, because I will need you to use your hands to make some signs of appreciations. Uh, three signs of appreciations. Uh, le premier, le premier signe d'appréciation, c'est pour nos autres, pour la délégation et la, le Parlement du Luxembourg. Vous avez fait un fantastique travail. Vous nous avez donné une grande organisation, une grande hospitalité. Et même quelques surprises. La, la, la fête d'hier soir, pour quelqu'un de nous, était une grande surprise. Euh, on a pensé que... Moi, j'ai toujours parlé de, de, la, de la rénovation de, de l'Assemblée, de rendre l'Assemblée la, la, un peu plus moderne. Je ne croyais pas qu'on pouvait devenir si moderne comme la fête que vous avez organisée hier soir après la, la fête officielle. Donc, merci beaucoup pour votre organisation. Merci Rita et tout, tout le staff qui a travaillé à cette organisation. Vous avez fait un grand travail. Un deuxième mot d'appréciation, c'est pour les interprètes. Vous êtes resté là encore 15 minutes. Je vous remercie pour que vous êtes resté avec nos petits retards. Mais vous faites un grand travail. Et le... c'est un remerciement, pas du secrétaire général aux interprètes, mais c'est de collègue à collègue. Merci beaucoup. E l'ultimo punto, signor Presidente, se mi consente, lo faccio in italiano perché la persona di cui sto per parlare capisce l'italiano, quindi purtroppo non parlo il portoghese, avrei fatto in portoghese l'intervento. Uh, una parola di ringraziamento a un membro dell'Assemblea parlamentare, un'icona dell'Assemblea parlamentare, dovrei dire, che ci lascia, che ci ha lasciato uh, un, un mese fa e è diventato un membro del Parlamento europeo, la signora Isabel Santos, che è qui con noi. Isabel Santos ha già iniziato il suo mandato. Ci sarà tempo per, i, per gli applausi, è il primo, il primo, ce ne sono altri. Isabel Santos ha appena iniziato il suo mandato come eh, parlamentare europea, eh, in rappresentante del Portogallo, ma da noi ha lavorato come capo del Comitato della Terza Dimensione dei diritti umani, è stato, capo, eh, è stato vicepresidente della nostra Assemblea, è stato a capo di numerose eh, eh, monitoraggi elettorali, 
è stata a capo del monitoraggio elettorale negli Stati Uniti, per esempio, e ha fatto delle visite, diciamo, anche storiche, è stata a Guantanamo, è stata a Lampedusa, è stata tu nei, in tutti i confini dell'OSCE, eh, guardando sempre agli aspetti dei diritti umani, non guardando solo in una direzione, ma guardando in tutto lo spettro dell'Assemblea uh, dell parlamentare. Questo credo che sia una grande qualità, Isabella, cioè guardare eh, ai valori dell'OSCE non classicamente a est di Vienna ma guardando a tutto lo spettro della ragione OSCE e credo che quello che tu hai fatto per l'assemblea rimane qualcosa nella nostra storia e ho un piccolo pensiero per te se vuoi venire sul palco e dire due parole. Grazie Isabella. I wrote uh, a speech for this moment, but uh, as all beautiful speech are um, pieces of memories, and I, I'm not going to read. I only want to say, because I, I know we are <laughs> very later, I only want to say to you that uh, you will remind in deeply of, in deep of my heart. It was a great pleasure, it was a great honor to serve this institution, serve OSCPA with all of you during these eight years of my political life. It was a good school and uh, OSCPA uh, is always a good school for politicians that embrace different challenges in different scenarios. So I wish you all the best when I look to this room and I see familiar faces. I remember very challenging but also very beautiful moments, very emotional moments in my life and uh, please, when you go to Portugal or when you go to Brussels, remember me, call me, you will have a Portuguese woman with open arms waiting for you. I wish you all the best, all the best. Thank you, Isabel. Oh. Thank you. Okay. And, and uh, so this is the past and this is the future. Yes, the best is yet to come for all of us. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Isabel. So this basically concludes my statement. Uh, I thank you all members for a great annual sessions, and uh, I wish you all a great summer break. Uh, see you all in Marrakesh, of course, if there are questions to my report, but I think we are running out of time. But if you have any questions, please, I'm here at your service. Thank you. I don't think that there will be questions now. That was already, uh, the, our members listen to your report, they see your work, and of course it's appreciated that why you, you are supported and you are Secretary General for next, until which year? 2000? December 2025. 2025, not bad. For politicians it's, 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 it's not a common, That's so we have, we have challenges more, quite more often, of course. No? Okay, <clears throat> now we'll ask uh, Lord Bonus, our first teller, to announce the results of the election of the OACPA officers. Mr. President, members of the Assembly, thank you very much indeed. Can I just take one moment? 
uh, as chairman of the drafting committee uh, of this declaration that you have just approved to thank the staff who uh, prepared this, who worked very late last night so that it was ready for you today. And uh, the members of the drafting committee in many ways have it easy. It is all those people in the offices behind, led by Miss Kate Ems, from, actually from the United Kingdom, uh, that has enabled it to be here. So thank you very much to them. Uh, now, turning to the job for which you asked me to do, uh, Mr. President, I uh, can confirm that uh, the elections were carried out in uh, accordance with uh, the rules. I thank uh, Ms. Carrie Hendrickson and Mr. Peter Ossowski, uh, my co-tellers, uh, who helped oversee the elections. You have already in front of you the result of uh, the elections uh, for the uh, vice presidents. Um, there, were no, there was no need for a ballot, but uh, Mr. De Sena from Portugal, Mr. Dobre from uh, Romania, and Mr. Guliev from Azerbaijan were elected by acclamation to serve till the end of 2022. <laughs> And I, of course, we all congratulate them on their uh, success. And there was only one nomination for the office of uh, treasurer. Uh, that was uh, Peter Jensen from Denmark. And we congratulate him too. <laughs> there was an election for uh, the office of president of the assembly. Uh, two, there were two candidates. And I can give you the result now. Uh, Mrs. Doris Barnett received 84 votes. Mr. George Serratelli received 120 votes and there were two spoilt ballots. And therefore, Mr. Serratelli is elected to the end of the 2020 uh, session. And I offer him my congratulations. Thank you very much indeed. Friends, uh, I will say something if I can, of course, because I'm speaking all the time. But first, if it's uh, our host from Luxembourg delegation, they'd like to take floor uh, at the end. Okay. Mr. President, thanks for the floor. First of all, I, I would like to congratulate you for your re-election. So, Mr. President, dear colleagues, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Sometimes, when you have the feeling that the session just started a moment ago, suddenly you already start saying goodbye to people again. So time flies. But as we say in French, c'est un au revoir, pas un adieu. In the name of Luxembourg, the Luxembourgish delegation, I'm saying goodbye till we meet again. So dear friends, I sincerely hope that you all enjoyed your exchanges and you stay here in Luxembourg. I hope that you are able to collect some nice memories for you to take home, and that these memories might inspire you to come back to the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. It has been an immense pleasure to have all, you, all of you here. We are all looking forward to seeing you here again. So, I wish you all the best. Have a safe trip home. Merci beaucoup et au revoir. Spasiba, dos vidania. Merci. I think uh, all, all business done. Huh? Is there anything to do at this moment? No. Uh, what I can say, of course, uh, the speech prepared, but uh, I can't go to that topics now. Uh, what I'd like to say, dear colleagues, first of all, it's a great appreciation uh, to all of you 
who voted and not to vote. It, it doesn't matter because it matters at some point, but now I think everything is clear. But I firstly like to thank Doris Barnett, who was, let's say, my rival in this competition, but uh, that's, a, that's a very usual for the politicians. I think, that, I think that we all went through this at some point. I care, first of all, about this organization, about the OSCE. Our Secretary General just <clears throat> outlined all the topics, and it's another reason to remind to you what we discussed here at this assembly, why we discussed here at the assembly, why we had those discussions in the committees, why we approved those resolutions. That's our obligation of politicians from 57 countries to respond to the needs of our people. We know where are challenges, we know where are problems. We understand that unfortunately we don't have that miracle power to decide over those challenges in one day or in one night. It's an important burden Huge work, you have steadily, we have to steadily work for this to achieve even sometimes small results. When it's conflict resolution or it's terrorism or migration or other things. But I'm very much satisfied that my colleagues here came up with the great ideas about youth, about gender, how to speed up the process which we started here or we're following here. The other, other ma major important topics. <clears throat> what I'd like to say, you know, from the bottom of my heart, there's a lot of people who are beyond the scene here. Maybe you can't see people who worked in our secretariat. Of course, I will go on and say a few words about our Luxembourgish colleagues, but now I'd like to thank our secretariat for their great work, and we need that work to have results and effectiveness of our Parliamentary Assembly. So applause to all of them who are here around. I can't, can't list their names. And of course, uh, uh, I feel great when think that when I'm looking at the faces of my colleagues here, there are some of them who took with a great responsibility even this endeavor, with the, with the, with even these elections. There are people who change their itiner itineraries. They stay and they vote and they finally, you know, fulfill their own obligation. Not only discussions, but also this process of elections to give, to, to give a special, let's say, recommendations and assignment to President Woodit Bizzaratelli or Barnett or others what to do, how to proceed, and how to work hard for this, for this assembly that we serve. And I think with this re-election, I feel greater responsibility that it was even uh, uh, during my first elections. And uh, uh, here was my dear colleague, Isabel Santos. We spent many years in this assembly. I'm very proud that she was elected as a member of European Parliament. And uh, of course, with congratulations is good, but we're joking with Roberto that we have also a small caucus in the European Parliament to help us to lobby all those important issues that we're elaborating here and then asking them to, to support also in their uh, assembly. So I'd like also to congratulate Roman Haider, uh, Nacho, our Ignacio Sanchez Amor, our Spanish colleague, and all this team I think will be good friends <coughs> for the parliamentary assembly. I don't want to be very long because that will be boring. You listen to me many times and I'm sorry for this along this week, but Finally, I'd like to thank our Luxembourgish colleagues. To me, uh, this is became, it was special. I'd never been just uh, two months ago. I was here and had a great impression, but what you did for us, for the assembly, for promotion of the work of parliamentary assembly on this level, starting with these nice halls and ending with a great, let's say, night that we had yesterday with my colleagues to discharge all these difficulties and, and this negativity sometimes that we're getting during our discussion. So thank you very much, dear colleagues, the delegation, speaker, uh, prime minister, grand duke, and all the people who met us with the with open heart in Luxembourg. It is also special now 
to me because I was re-elected here. Thank you very much again, and applause to you for your great work. So that's, I thought that Berlin, Berlin stays as a, as a great city also. I was first time elected and not because of that. In Berlin, I said that it was first city as a former, as a citizen of former Soviet Union, first time I went to Berlin, and it was also my honeymoon there. So Berlin will stay there as my favorite city, but Luxembourg did a great job. And once again, thank you very much. We are heading now to different places, safe trips back. Wish you all the best. Wish me also the success because you now entrusted me again, and I wish really success to our assembly. Thank you very much for all your activities and your friendship and collegiality. Thank you once again.